All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Steve Wilson from the State Water Survey. And today is our um, pub private well class webinar on um, is my water safe to drink common questions. So, um, some, you know, there's some questions we get every month um, and are the most common things that people are concerned with. And so we try to deal with those things uh, in this webinar. Okay, um, I do wanna say that this program is funded through uh, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, which is a nonprofit. Uh, that has staff all over the country that work with uh, private wells and small water and wastewater systems through a grant from US EPA. And uh, that's what allows us to do the work that we do. So um, we're certainly grateful to them. All right, so um, as I mentioned, today's webinar is part of a national program. I, what I didn't mention, I will a little bit more in a minute, is that RCAP also has staff um, that are working on private well issues around the country. Um, and so these materials that we're gonna go through today follow our course. There are uh, some of the things to go in more detail related to specific as aspects of our course, um, but the private well class is actually a 10 lesson class that you sign up for that's not this webinar. And so if you're interested in the class, which is a lot more detailed than we can provide today on a range of topics to help you become a better steward and a manager of your well, um, I'll show you how to do that in a little bit, but it's certainly um, something you should sign up for. That class, like our webinar, is completely free, and uh, we certainly recommend that you um, go through those lessons and learn as much as you can about how to take care of your well. So um, during the webinar today, um, I'm, we're going to spend probably half or more of our time answering the questions you all asked in advance, um, but there will be time at the end for any follow-up questions. So if you have a question as we go through the material today or something comes up you didn't think of, um, there is a chat box and a question box on your go to webinar um, window. Um, you can add up uh, ask questions in there. Katie's going to monitor that today and uh, make she's making a list and we'll pull that up at the end and uh, and go through those for as long uh, as you guys are willing to be here. We're willing to try to answer. So and I'll also say if I can answer a question, I might ask you to email us um, and we'll find an answer for you, but it just might not be today. Okay, so for those that are um, here that are EHPs or looking for uh, NEHA uh, continuing education credit or from Illinois, if you're an LHP, LEHP, um, if you need those for your license, um, this class is worth those uh, CEs. And um, so for NEHA, you can't take the same course with the same core content more than once each of your two-year credentialing cycles. And so if your credentialing cycle just started 1 1 21, uh, January 1st, and so your last one ended on 12 31 20. If you take this today, you won't be able to take the same course and get credit for it until after 1 1 23. I just want to make that clear. Um, there are in the handouts part of your go to webinar window, there's um, worksheets there for you. There's also a worksheet for anyone who wants to follow along and fill out today. And uh, what we'll provide you. Um, if you're interested in CEs, email us after the webinar is over at info at privatewellclass.org. Um, we can get you a PDF copy of the slide deck, the completed NEHA forms, and a certificate of attendance. And if you want a certificate of attendance for an, another reason, uh, that's fine. Just email us and ask us for that, and uh, we can provide it. And I've listed here on the bottom right corner um, the other times this particular webinar has been provided. And so if you attended any of these, as a someone looking for NEHA credit and got credit for it, then you can't get credit for it today. Okay. So, um, yeah, I guess I already went through this. We have got a lot of questions and um, we'll sign, answer as many of those as we can. But I just wanna my name is Steve Wilson. I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the State Water Survey, which is on the campus of the U of I, University of Illinois. Um, I've been here 32 years. Um, we help well owners in Illinois every day. Um, we um, house the state's well logs and have a public service lab and uh, do a lot of uh, applied research related to groundwater in Illinois and around the country. And Katie Buckley is helping me today. She's part of our team. She's a water resources outreach specialist here at the survey. And again, she's gonna field the questions you guys ask online um, during the webinar and we'll put those, actually we share Google Doc and I just pull it over on the screen at the end and she'll keep track of those as we go. So a little bit about RCAP. Um, so RCAP's a Rural Community Assistance Partnership, as I mentioned. It's a partnership 
of six regional nonprofit affiliates, and these are their names. So they're, they're different name, like Communities Unlimited, uh, which is based in uh, the headquarters in Arkansas, but they serve Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and all those states. Um, not only do they work with private well owners, but they work with small water and wastewater systems. Um, they also work on economic development in rural areas. A lot of things to help um, maintain uh, the rural world as we're used to it or to help it improve, as well as um, we have a team of about 14 of us all together um, that work on private well issues around the country. So someone, for instance, in Texas can, can uh, contact Communities Unlimited and one of their staff who works on private well issues um, can get back to you about things like the assessment I'm about to talk about. Um, but they're, they're great folks and uh, I work with them uh, regularly. Um, we're all part of uh, the same team, if you will, um, to serve you all. Um, the assessment I mentioned, so we developed a, here at the U of I, we worked with uh, 13 experts from around the country and developed a private well and spring as well assessment. And what it's meant to be is kind of a vulnerability assessment. You go through um, all kinds of issues, the geology, the well type, you take, uh, they come out and we'll take a look at your well or your spring and um, identify any potential sources, um, let you know if it's not sealed properly, just uh, an overall view of whether it's properly constructed and looking if they can find your well log. Um, um, you know, do you have treatment? Do you sample like you're supposed to? All those things, and it's something that they work with you one-on-one -on -one with, and then um, in the end, they'll fill this out and give you a copy for you to keep. And uh, your well log, if they can find it, if there is one on file, um, it depends on the state how good those records are, but even in a state like Illinois, where we're actually ahead of the game as far as well logs and our drillers work really well with us to provide those um, and our county health departments. Um, we still only probably have 50 to 60% of the logs on file for the wells that are actually in use. And in some states that were later uh, into the game to start requiring those things, um, they have much less. And so it's not uh, certainly not always uh, likely that you're going to find a log if you don't have a copy. And so this is a good point to say that if you have a new well drilled or you're working with the driller or the contractor who actually installed your well, call them up today or tomorrow if you don't have a log and ask them for a copy. And if a driller won't give you a copy of your well log, um, call me, I'll, I'll talk to them um, because it's really, it's yours and uh, you should be privy to that information. And hopefully your state has it on file or your county or local health district. But it's a really cool tool that you can use to identify possible problems. And it also gives the RCAP folks a chance to talk to you about best practices, why you need to sample annually, um, all those sorts of things. So it's like a sanitary survey for those of you who might uh, be health professionals that deal with that on the uh, public water side, um, which is something that every public water supply is required to do every three years. Um, so it's like that, it's a vulnerability assessment really. And it also is a chance to educate well owners uh, with someone who has uh, some wherewithal and private well experience as well as promote best practices, which I mentioned. It also um, allows you as a well owner to communicate with someone, have someone you can talk to, and someone you can call back later when there's issues, as well as, you know, we find a lot of well owners don't even consider calling their local health department because they're afraid that they'll condemn their well or tell them they can't use it. There are a few local jurisdictions where they've passed those sorts of rules, um, typically in the Northeast, but in 99% of the country, a uh, health department will certainly recommend you don't use your well if there's some dangerous feature to your well or it's contaminated in some way, but they can't tell you you can't drink it. And so you should rely on those folks uh, to help you and realize they have your health and, as their uh, primary interest and your families. And so um, these things go a long way towards uh, leaving some of those fears. And, you know, the RCAP folks aren't health professionals. They're more like I am. I'm a groundwater hydrologist and a civil engineer. Um, but we work in this field and have gained a lot of experience related to private well issues. So they've completed over 2,800 of these assessments around the country, which is just uh, phenomenal. And they do about 400 a year. So it's not like everyone who wants one can get one done right away, uh, but you can get on a list. And it's something uh, if you're interested in, you can let us know. We can get you to the right RCAP region um, or um, you can contact them directly. Um, most of the regions have a private well page on their website. 
that will give you a place to, to sign up for that or to ask questions or to get a hold of the right person. Um, they've also put on workshops, um, over 50 of those around the country uh, before COVID that were in person, a four hour workshop um, to help uh, professionals, EHPs and others um, know how to use this tool. Um, and so they've actually stopped doing those workshops, but we're going to hold one and have held one a year at least. It's four hours though, and to do that online um, is quite a, uh, an ask for everyone. But if you're interested, let us know. It's actually gonna be tomorrow or next Thursday, and you can find that on our webpage. But it goes through, um, so their assessment program also allows them to make relationships like with local health departments or watershed groups or others if you're one of those groups and are interested in holding a workshop, even a webinar online about private well issues, um, reach out to your RCAP affiliate or let us know and we'll get you in contact with the right one. They're always willing and interested in holding you know, evening workshops um, where it's a done by webinar, uh, where you can uh, learn some basics about uh, local geology or other sorts of uh, issues related to private wells. We actually do that as well um, sometimes. So. I work at the Illinois State Water Survey, which if you're not in Illinois, and even if you are, many people haven't heard of. Um, you've all heard of your state geological survey. We're a sister agency. Illinois started a water survey in 1895, so we're 126 years old today. Um, not today specifically, but this year, um, because of water quality issues. Back then, it was before chlorination for community water supplies. There were cholera and typhoid outbreaks, and our state legislature started a water survey to start investigating those problems and also um, you know, water quality and streams and ecology of those sorts of things because of dumping. You know, even large communities only use septic systems and, and which went straight into rivers and creeks back then, um, well before we understood um, all the water quality ramifications of bacteria and E. coli and all those things. And so um, we've been around a long time. We're part of the U of I. Um, we're a research agency. We have about 140 staff. Most of it's applied research related to groundwater, surface water, atmospheric sciences, and chemistry. A lot of seminal work in the country has been done here. It's a great place to work. Um, we're allowed to do things like the private well class where we can really help educate people as well as go out and do research studies on private wells um, related to different aspects like arsenic. I've done a lot of arsenic research in Illinois, for instance, in areas where we know it occurs. Um, just as an example, our files are full of records like this. This is from 1916. It was a case of typhoid uh, that was an outbreak in Pena, Illinois. And so uh, the water survey went down and investigated all the cases. There were 32, I think, or 35. And um, in the end, they thought it was the fact that they had a brand new water plant but weren't using it, um, or that half the town was sewered and the other half was still not sewered. Um, but in the end, it ended up being the Pena Ice Cream Company, which is shown in the middle here. And um, they also sold milk. Seven different farmers brought in milk, uh, and it was all stored in one large tank, storage tank or vat. And uh, everyone used the same bucket to get water, to get milk out of that, and then poured it into their own containers to take home. And uh, it had typhoid in it. And so everyone uh, who was using that milk, a uh, number of folks got sick over the course of less than a month. And uh, once that was solved, that was all fixed, and uh, that went away. And it's just, um, you can read this whole story in our uh, Pena city files, which we have files for every community in Illinois about their water supply. Um, so it's just really interesting what's there and the history that actually goes on here. And I always like to show this is some young man helping a water survey uh, field scientist who's doing uh, some testing of water in New Athens, Illinois. Um, I believe this is in 1912, but don't quote me on that. Um, you know, that's what a field kit looked like back in the day. You brought your own microscope and uh, you had all these glass bottles. I can't imagine how much they went through with spillage and breakage and all those sorts of things. But it's a, a cool uh, photograph that was available in our archives. And uh, so I show it here just to uh, kind of talk about the history of what we've been able to accomplish. So to, on to today's topic, um, three things to remember if you're a private well owner. One is that they're not regulated. Usually there's regulations for how they're constructed and maybe have to be tested once they're installed. But unless you sell your property, which in some states at the sale of a property, now you're required to also test, there are no regulations that require your water to meet any kind of standard like there are for community water supplies. So you're, import, you're in charge of making sure your water is safe to drink and it's maintained. Um, 
And the other thing to remember is water can, you know, my dad always said our water tasted so great. I grew up on an old dug well. Um, it was contaminated. It always had been. It was a shallow dug well. Uh, when it rained hard, it was muddy. Uh, the muddy water got cloudy. It was totally unsafe, but he swore it was better than city water because it didn't have chemicals in it. You know, the city puts chemicals in water and that's bad. You know, it's not the case. Um, contaminants, natural occurring contaminants especially, can be colorless, odorless, and have no taste. But, um, you know, without any kind of um, testing to ensure that it's not getting bacteria into your well and those sorts of things, um, you can't go by the taste or the color um, or by the smell. You have to test, and that's just the way it is. Arsenic is a great example. You can't see, taste, or smell arsenic, um, it's, but if it's in groundwater, um, it's, it's going to come up in your well. And we have several areas in Illinois where there is high arsenic, and those counties are well aware of that and uh, do outreach to citizens in those counties. Um, but you don't know unless you test. And I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit. Um, so now I live in town, I, so I'm on a community water supply, and I pay 40 to $50 a month, which I need to update this, and I never remember to. My daughter's nine, and um, she's at a point where she takes long showers and all those things, and so our water bill has crept up over the last couple of years. Now it's 60 or $70 a month. Um, but that's the cost spread out over all the residents in, in our community for sampling, maintenance that the city provides or the water system provides, and all the infrastructure so that when I turn on my tap, I have water and have it with pressure. Um, at your house, if you're on a private well, you're responsible for all those things. If all of a sudden you don't have water pressure, you're gonna have to rely on, uh, you're gonna have to bring somebody in or if you can do it yourself, um, you're in charge of making sure that stuff gets taken care of and your equipment is up to date and you're testing to be sure the water's still safe. All of those things are your responsibility as a well owner. Um, so about our class and these webinars, these are the things that we're really trying to get across. That you need to understand your well log and where your water's coming from. That means knowing if your pumps, if it's a submersible pump, what depth it's set at. If it's a, um, if it's a, a pump above ground, what's the intake set at? How deep? Um, what is so your pump setting basically? Does it have a screen or is it a bedrock well? Sand, sand and gravel wells have a screen. Very few bedrock wells do, but a few. Um, how much casing is there? You know, you can have a well that's 200 feet deep that's sand and gravel, and the, the screen is at 195 to 200 feet below land surface. The rest of it's solid pipe, so the only place water can get in is where the screen is, and that's good. You want all that um, solid space between where your water's coming in your well and the surface where the contamination can seep in. A bedrock well is usually only cased into the bedrock. So if your bedrock's only at 10 feet below land surface or you're in an area where bedrock's at the surface, most states now have a requirement for at least 50 feet of casing, um, but that's all you have. You could have a 600 foot well and it only has 50 feet of casing. That means the rest of that is an open hole in the bedrock where cracks and fissures can let water in, but it also means water can get in your well at below 50 feet, not at 600 feet where you might assume that because that's the depth. So understanding that and especially old wells that are allowed to um, that were grandfathered in to the state rules. Um, you know, New York's a great example. Upstate New York has a lot of wells that are several hundred feet deep, but may only have 15 to, or less feet of casing because bedrock's at the surface. And that means that below 15 feet, water can enter your well. And so those are not safe uh, from surface contamination in most cases, because a lot of those fractures in the rock actually do run back up to the surface somewhere. And so understanding those things is critical to you as a well owner to understand what your risk might be and what you need to test for, um, how concerned you should be, all those things. Um, and again, naturally occurring contaminants. You know, I mentioned arsenic, there's others, and I'll show you an example in a little bit. Um, you're responsible for, it's easy enough to contact your local health district, your state geological survey or resource agency, which might be a DNR, you know, it's the people that either regulate drillers or well construction, assuming you have that in your state. The only two that really don't are Pennsylvania and Alaska. Um, and so if you're in another, any other state, you can find out from them um, and they can get you to the right folks, probably your geo survey or in Illinois, the water survey, um, the folks that study water quality in aquifers and would understand whether there's any naturally con occurring contaminants in your area. And the other important thing is once you learn the basics about your well and how it works and 
some of those things that may be totally uh, to you today, you may not understand. Um, you need to take our class in order to understand those things, well types, all that sort of stuff, which we can't go through all of that today. We have other webinars for those things. Um, but it helps you to understand the right questions to ask, and it informs you so that, one, you're doing the right thing, um, just like with shock chlorination. If you have a contractor shock chlorinate your well for you because you had a bacteria sample that turned out positive, you'll know by going through our lessons in our class and the materials we provide whether they're going about it the right way, and sometimes they don't. And so um, we try to correct that all the time, but it's, um, you know, it's just an issue. It's the more you know to protect yourself, the better off you are. And then the last thing, uh, which we'll drill into folks every webinar, every lesson, is how important it is to sample your well. And we'll go through that uh, here later in this webinar. So testing is by far, testing and sampling are by far the most common question we get, you know, including these, where do I collect it? What do I test for? You know, it's, um, you know, there's a lot of concern there. It's not something that we, it's typically part of our lifestyle, if you will. And so it's kind of a foreign concept. And uh, a lot of people just assume groundwater is safe because it's underground and it's protected. Well, it's not, or even if the groundwater is protected, if your well isn't properly constructed, it could be letting things in your well from near the surface. And so there's a lot more to it than just assuming your groundwater is safe because, you know, even though natural groundwater in many cases is completely safe, it doesn't mean that your well water is safe um, because of the things we've done in installing the well or installing the pipes or, uh, you know, contamination from other sources, man-made sources and things like that. So where do you collect your sample? Um, your drinking water is what, you know, typically you'd sample your drinking water out of your kitchen tap. And that's because that's where you're getting your water for cooking, most of your water for, um, you know, uh, that you drink. And you might have a fridge that has um, its own water thing and a filter. Um, you might want to take a sample there as well to make sure your filter in your fridge is working correctly. But there's also other considerations. And because of that, the water that's actually being pumped out of your well may be of a different quality than the water coming out of your kitchen tap not only because of filters or other treatment, but because of lead pipes or copper pipes with lead solder um, or because of the treatment devices you have. It can really make a difference. And so for instance, our lab, a lot of the time we're sampling water for a research purpose as well. So we wanna know what the natural groundwater quality is as well as protecting somebody's public, their, their health by sampling their drinking water. So a lot of times we'll ask people to collect two samples one from their kitchen tap that's been through all their piping and all their treatment, and one from an outside spigot or a hydrant near the well that is getting water directly from the well before it's gone through all of those things uh, in your house. And you know, a lot of times we we'll ask people to let it run, let, us, let a hydrant run for 20 minutes and then collect the sample outside, but collect your sample in the house you know, uh, first so that it is uh, what you're typically gonna drink. And um, the other thing is a good lab will provide detailed instructions when you contact them about how to collect it, where to collect it. And I bring that up about the um, two samples because that's what we use to understand um, how treatment or the piping or um, even just being brought up above ground. You know, a lot of water has very little oxygen in it because it's buried so deep. Um, you bring it up and it goes in your pressure tank that's got air in it. Um, all of a sudden you're exposing it to air and that's where you see iron. That's why you have iron stains on your uh, sinks and, and uh, bathtubs. It's because that iron's in solution until it hits air and then it uh, reacts and forms iron oxide, which is the red stuff that you see. Um, and so all those things happen. Uh, it makes a difference once you bring it up out of the ground. Um, so I'm, I got ahead of myself. Um, I just explained this, I think. They can be significantly different, and so we do suggest two samples. Um, that's not always economical or, or affordable for some folks, and you know, in the, the bottom line is you're trying to protect your health, and so you, in the first place you should always sample is your kitchen tab. But if you can do these things, it might lead to, you know, for instance, if you sample your kitchen tap and you do have lead, um, it's likely from your prom plumbing, your premise plumbing, you know, on your premises, if you will, um, and so, that's a different animal than assuming you have lead in your well water, which is very unlikely. You don't, we don't see lead very often in well water itself um, or coming from the ground. It's usually in the piping that's causing that problem. 
And so it's just a good way to understand those things. And so I'm gonna show you a quick example. This is a home that's near, near us um, in a, a, the aquifer that our community actually uses for its water supply as well, it's a private well. And this is the outside spigot. So this is the natural water quality. You can see um, on the bottom right, the alkalinity, alkalinity is 358, the hardness is 351. Um, it's got silica in it, which is natural. It's, you know, probably the second, I think it's the second most common element um, to our silica and is to oxygen uh, on the earth. Um, but other things, the sodium is 25.9 up on the upper left. And I think that's, uh, and the turbidity and color in the middle on the right are fairly high, which means, you know, it's natural groundwater. It's got some stuff in it. It's not perfectly clear. There's some sediment that's coming up with things. And that's kind of a common thing. That's got a little bit of a hydrogen sulfide smell, which is also very common. So then he took a sample after his filter and softener. So he's got a regular salt filter using sodium chloride salt. And look what the softener did to the sodium levels in the water. It went from 25 to 198, which means, you know, if you're a person on a low sodium diet and you're trying to drink, you know, the 64 ounces of water or whatever every day, um, you know, you drink a lot of water, that could have a little bit of an effect um, on your diet. Um, also, though, you can see on the good side, the softener is doing its job. On the lower right, the hardness went to 0.68 from 300 and something. And the turbidity and color, the filter helped remove those as well. Um, and a lot of things, the less than signs mean lower than our detection limit. And so, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of, there's, there's no real health issues in any of these. Um, and I guess I should point out the pH is 8.1, which is natural for Illinois groundwater. It's a little high. I mean, neutral is seven, excuse me. <clears throat> but um, it's, you know, it's, that's certainly within range of what most drinkable groundwater is. So then this person added a RO system to their kitchen tap. And you can see, um, you know, reverse osmosis removes many things. It doesn't remove boron, clearly, if you look at there. Um, but now a lot of things are below detection limit. It's taking out some of the buffering in the water, though. So now their pH is down to 6.23, which, you know, lower pH can cause corrosion problems. And so um, since this is at the kitchen tap, it's not sitting in pipes at that low pH, um, where, you know, the alkalinity is also fairly low. Um, so you're not going to see corrosion problems here, um, but it could have an effect on other types of water in other parts of the country if the pH is already uh, lower or, there, um, you know, it uh, can cause unintended consequences is my point. And so it's really valuable information. I'm not going to show this here, but this person also sent in two samples, one right before his softener regenerated and one right after to see how well his softener was working. And it's an amazing difference. Um, at the end of the cycle for his softener, um, it wasn't working that well, but as soon as it regenerated, um, it, it's doing all of what it's supposed to do to soften the water and uh, all those things. So you can really learn a lot from water samples is uh, also the other side of this. And it's information, you know, you can um, share even with us. We are more than glad to take a look at it. We certainly recommend that anytime you have a sample collected, you have a qualified health professional look at it typically your local health department, um, ask someone in environmental health uh, to review your results with you. So, um, you know, every situation is different. That's the, the bad side of this. Um, you need to ask, you can't just go with what, um, you know, we're gonna give you a list of things of what we recommend, but we also caveat that by saying, you also need to talk to your local or state health department for advice on what to sample for. Um, because there may be, um, local contaminants of concern that aren't that common, um, for instance. Or you may know that, like I know in Tazewell County, Illinois, I would tell people to sample for arsenic. We actually recommend that for everyone. But in some parts of the state, we don't see any arsenic in the groundwater. And so it's really not necessary, especially if it's a separate charge. Um, so you need to ask, and it depends on how deep your water is coming from. If you've got an old dug shallow well, you know, it's better to uh, be sure you sample for bacteria and nitrate, um, and they're probably gonna be high because those are fairly ubiquitous at the surface and they typically find a way into shallow groundwater supplies. Um, you can also ask co-op extension. Um, the lab should be able to help you as well, but, um, you know, ask all those questions, try to be informed. You know, being a little bit of an investigator um, just helps you um, protect your family uh, and your water supply. 
So um, I show this example. This is from Rhode Island Department of Health, just to emphasize this uh, issue. All the little dots they have on this map are because those used to be orchards, and every one of them used arsenic through the, you know, especially in the through the 40s through the 60s, for as a pesticide for their orchards. Um, so much was used that many of these areas are now the soils contaminated with arsenic. And uh, where that can leach down into groundwater, it's also a concern for the wells in the area. And so they've just made this map uh, as an uh, to tell you if you live in one of these areas or close to it, you might consider testing for arsenic if you weren't going to. Um, the big splotch in the middle, uh, that's really the point of this slide, um, is where there's high beryllium. And, you know, obviously we've all heard of beryllium. I honestly, until I found this in I think 2013 or so on their website, um, I had no idea that beryllium was a regulated contaminant under the Safe Drinking Water Act, which means communities have to remove it if they have it um, because it has health effects. You know, I had no idea it was regulated because you don't run across it in very many places. And this is the only one in the States that I know of where there's a large uh, area with natural occurring beryllium. And so if you live in Rhode Island in this area though, beryllium should be on your list. And so, um, you know, you can do a little investigation. I went to the Rhode Island Department of Health. There's other sites available with other states. Um, and they may provide you with other information that, um, and even then, you know, you can follow up by calling the Rhode Island Department of Health and asking for a groundwater person to ask them specifically about beryllium if you're interested and want to learn what the risks are and all those things. I mean, you can certainly look it up online. A lot of people just do that, but make sure you're using a trusted source like a state resource agency, um, compliance agency, or, uh, you know, EPA or USGS, um, places like that. Um, another example, this is from Massachusetts. You can type in your address, and if you have a bedrock well at this address, they're gonna tell you whether there's a likelihood of you having arsenic or uranium contamination in your well. Um, they've studied that in the state. The DEQ there, or DEP, excuse me, um, understands and has maps of where that stuff is, and uh, they've created this tool for folks to use um, that'll help you understand whether, because you know, testing for uranium is not something that's commonly done either, but um, you'd certainly want to consider if you're in one of those areas. Um, and you can, again, call DEP for more information and talk to someone who um, is familiar with Massachusetts and can give you uh, better advice than I can. Uh, the last one I'll show you here, and I meant to change this slide. I was just on this website last week, and this slide is several years old, but this site's still available. Um, the DNR in Wisconsin is the agency that regulates drillers and um, well construction, and they contracted with uh, the University of Stevens Point in Wisconsin to develop this, their Center for Watershed Science and Education. And so you can go on this, it's a web map that allows you to go in and like, I clicked on arsenic by county, and so it's telling me the average arsenic value for the counties where they have information. You can see there's four or five counties here that are clear, and you can see the road and the topography underneath it. That's because when I this was made, it was fairly new and they didn't have data in it for those counties. Um, but you know, the arsenic standard for a community water supply is 10 parts per billion or micrograms per liter, which it shows up there in the legend. The green is five uh, or less. And one county had none detected. This map looks a lot different today. All of them are filled in. The amount of uh, red is less, but the amount of green or yellow um, is higher. And uh, so they've got more samples in over the last four years and uh, added that to this database. And it's a great tool. You know, if I was gonna move to the Green Bay area where the three red counties are, um, that means the average arsenic sample was over 21, uh, which is twice the legal limit for a community water supply. But as a private well owner, you're responsible for doing not doing anything if you don't want to um, or adding treatment to get rid of that. And, you know, I mentioned Tazewell County earlier. We did, I've done several studies out there working with many well owners. And some have lived on that property since their grandfather lived on that property uh, 80 years ago. And they're like, you know, my grandpa lived to be 86. It never bothered him. And maybe it won't bother you. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, all these things affect different people differently. And some people are immunocompromised and those things. But if I have water that I know is over what's considered a safe health standard, do I really want to let my kids, my grandkids, my neighbors, my friends come over and drink that water, even if I feel like it's not going to affect me? You know, it's important to understand the ramifications um, of having those things in there. And 
you know, we ran across several wells in Tazewell County that had arsenic um, well over 100. And those folks, uh, and you know, they don't plan to do anything about it. And that's their choice. That's why you're independent, you're a well owner, um, there's no state rules or even local rules. And um, it's just realize what that means. Uh, you may think it's fine for you, but um, you're also imposing that on other people who might drink the water from your well. Um, bottom line here though, is there's some cool tools out there. Uh, this is probably one of the best um, for finding information uh, related to different constituents. And you can choose different things. You can choose alkalinity, alkalinity or pH or nitrate. Um, you've got a bunch of choices here. So here's what we recommend. Um, we recommend annually. Now, you know, Penn State, uh, they have a great program at Penn State uh, University, their extension program. They have a really awesome private well program. And the guy who runs that, Brian Swistock, suggests every 14 months so that over time, you're actually sampling in different times of the year. So if there are any seasonal differences, you're going to catch them over time. It's actually not a bad idea. And so, I mean, we still recommend annually. It's uh, what we've always uh, done. But I want to mention that because it's probably not uh, a bad choice. And to be clear, you sample for coliform and nitrate because they're so ubiquitous, or they're so common at the surface. And you shouldn't have coliform in your well, and you shouldn't have higher than background levels of nitrate in your well. If you do, it means that you're likely to have either a shallow source that's causing that to get in your well, or your well isn't properly sealed at the surface. That could be the cap's not sealed, could be there's a breach in the casing somewhere near the surface. There's a lot of reasons. Or it could be an old hand dug well like the one I grew up on, which you know my grandpa hand dug that in 1933. He dug a 14 foot hole and then lined the inside with bricks. No cement, no anything. Water can seep in literally from the surface right into the well. Um, and so, uh, it's not safe and it does have bacteria in it. Plus it was in our pasture where we had livestock. So uh, you figure that out. Anyway, um, coliform doesn't cause sickness, E. coli does. But if you test for coliform and it's in there, that means there's a pathway for things like E. coli or even other uh, organisms to get in your well. That's why um, coliform and nitrate testing are fairly cheap. They're fairly easy and they're used as an indicator not to say that you're, you've got a, uh, something causing sickness in your well, but they mean that you have a pathway into your well so that other things that could cause a problem, health problem, can get into your well. And it means you need to investigate why that occurred. So what we recommend uh, initially, if you've never done it, and then um, every three to five years, you know, and I, we say that because sometimes things can change. If you're in a deeper aquifer, the arsenic value should be nearly the same every time. You know, I have monitoring wells out in Tazewell County. Um, we've monitored since 1993. We sample them about every six to 10 years. And the wells that have arsenic at over 50 are always over 50. There's one or two wells that are always really low. They're always low. You know, the arsenic's naturally occurring. It's in the matrix of the uh, particles that make up the aquifer. It shouldn't change that much. If you um, your arsenic all of a sudden changed by 100% one direction or the other, something's changed with your water supply. Either something, water's getting in from another source and changing the chemistry, or something has occurred. We've even seen things as, um, you know, that you would never think of. Like there was a small earthquake in, in Missouri uh, about 15 years ago that actually affected water levels in some of our wells. Not the chemistry necessarily, but likely, um, we didn't. We actually just measure those water levels regularly. It lowered the water level in a few wells almost four feet. And what happened there was the bedrock shifted and it caused the fractures to either create new fractures or um, shifted where the fractures were actually providing water and it changed the water level in a well, you know, 100 miles away. And so you just don't know. And that's why it's always good. You know, like I said, we recommend every three to five years. Also, if the chemistry, if something does change, you know, for some reason, uh, maybe the water is a little more negative pH or lower pH than it used to be, even though you didn't have copper or lead issues five years ago, um, you sample again and you do, then you need to investigate why that's the case, um, if something's changed, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, especially these on the bottom bullet, you know, the TDS and alkalinity and chloride, all those things together with pH, um, uh, help understand, you know, the how aggressive your water might be. And aggressive is a term that encompasses both corrosive and scale forming. 
Um, and it doesn't just mean pH. It means that, you know, alkalinity is certainly uh, a contributor there as well. Um, and then in the end, you should also always go to your local or state health department uh, to determine um, what's best. And, you know, there's groups out there, some in the labs out there that have, you know, a, uh, a kit, if you will, um, that has all these things in it. And they say, you know, for this type of sample result or this type of private well, we offer this kit, this kit, and this kit. The one that has these in it may be a certain cost and one that's more um, comprehensive, maybe it includes uh, some kind of look at, um, you know, or, organic constituents or things like that, or pesticides, those are gonna be more expensive. Um, and I, you know, the advice we give on pesticides and those sorts of things is to look at your well and your chemistry and all that stuff first, because sampling for pesticides, there's one, there's a bunch of different pesticides that all have to be analyzed using different methods. And so it can be a pretty expensive endeavor. And you should really feel like there's a reason uh, or that there's a potential cause, not just because you wanna be safe. Now, if you have the money for that, then you should go ahead if it's for peace of mind. But a lot of folks, um, you know, you need to be careful with how you spend your dollars for that. So um, when do you test? Well, we recommend testing anytime the well's been open. Um, and if you had to disinfect your well, and what we're showing here is from El Paso County, Colorado, this is after wildfire. And uh, you know we have a short video on our webpage that explains what you should do before, during, and after a wildfire. Because in this case, these wires melted together, they hadn't shut off the power. And when that happened, the pump kicked on uh, and was on constantly and burned up. And so they lost their pump. Um, and you can see what it did to this well. I mean, everything has to be pulled out. Uh, the cap was even melted, so there may be stuff that's sloughed off down in the well. Um, you know, this well may have to be abandoned. I'm not sure what uh, happened in the end. But anytime you've had an event like a fire, if you're in a forested area or a flood and the water's over capture well, um, it's a good thing uh, to, to test it. So, um, and that's, you know, you can introduce things to well just by taking the cap off. And so it's, uh, you really need to be careful. And a lot of times you'd want to have, you know, a professional do those things. Uh, as far as getting it analyzed, you know, we recommend using certified labs. Every state accredits labs because all the communities in your state have to get samples done under the Safe Drinking Water Act to meet all the rules and the law in the states. Um, so like in Illinois, it's our state EPA. They require every community to have a licensed operator and all those things, but they also have to test every three months for a whole suite of things. Um, and so there's a, a lot of labs that do that work, and they also have to be certified through a state accreditation program so that they've shown that they have the capability to do those tests the right way and reach uh, comparable conclusions or comparable results um, so that you know the result you're getting from a lab is, is uh, accurate. And so um, you wanna call a certified lab or accredited lab in your state um, and maybe even out of state, a lot of them now will ship and you can do things, um, you know, the way the world is today with uh, our shipping av availability and overnight, uh, you can do this stuff uh, in a lot of places these days. But you should be able to talk to the lab and ask your questions. They should be able to give you instructions, explain, answer your questions. And, you know, I, I tell this to labs too, and we work with the Association of Public Health Labs. If someone calls you and you can't answer their questions, I tell well owners that they should go to a different lab. You need to have someone on staff that has private well experience and can understand that, especially if it's a big part of your business, because um, labs are a trusted source. And you know, I've had people call me and say, well, I called this lab and they told me they can't give me advice on what to sample for that I need to tell them. Well, I'd find a lab that can give you some advice. And again, uh, your health departments as well um, would be part of that. Okay, I rem oh, uh, sorry. Um, and a lab should be able to provide everything. You should, you know, again, whether it's in the mail or you go get it in person, you should be able to pick up a kit. It's got everything you need, instructions in the bottle, uh, when to collect it, you know, whether to let the water run, um, how full to fill the bottles, all those things should be provided for you. Um, you know, it should be, um, the things you need to be careful of is you know, not drop the cap, make sure you're following the instructions um, and, uh, you know, you're doing it in a clean environment, if you will. So you don't have your pets around or uh, those sorts of things. As far as interpreting results, there are websites out there, and I'm going to show you one that I consider kind of the best one. Um, but in the end, 
you should always take your results, especially if there's any questions about a health concern, to your local health department and get a qualified answer from them or even your doctor. Um, you Sometimes you might want to resample. It's not necessarily you do this every time, but especially if you have a really dramatic result, um, you may want to resample because labs do make mistakes. And sometimes, you know, a lot of times some of the methods require you uh, when doing the analysis uh, to basically um, come up with a, you know, a little piece of that sample so you're diluting a bunch of times. And uh, if they make a mistake in their dilutions, uh, it could show up as 10 times what it should have been or 100 times. And uh, so sometimes it's best to just get another sample for your own peace of mind. But if you test for coliform bacteria, uh, then you should have any, it's positive, then you should have an E. coli test performed. And you shouldn't drink your water until you can chlorinate your well or disinfect your well, that should say. Um, typically that's shock chlorination. Um, until you've uh, chlorinated or disinfected your well, and you've collected a sample after that that shows that that E. coli has been removed or that bacteria has been removed. And so um, uh, that's what we recommend. So the site I mentioned, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services developed this, um, oh boy, probably in 2015 or 2016. It's called the Be Well Informed Guide. So they did this for the residents in New Hampshire, but it's a tool anyone can use. And so um, what it does is you can take your water sample and you can plug in the results. And it will basically give you, tell you whether it's over any kind of MCL, which MCL is maximum contaminant level under the Safe Drinking Water Act that communities have to meet. So, you know, again, you could have arsenic at 20 or 50 parts per billion in your well water and decide it's okay and you're going to drink it. Um, you know, the standard before 2005 or so in the United States was 50, and they lowered it to 10 based on health research that showed that uh, arsenic at even lower than 10 levels probably could cause problems for some people. So um, anyway, um, this tells you whether it's over an MCL. And again, uh, community water supplies, you know if you're on a community water supply that your water is below all those MCLs because they're required to meet that by law. Um, and if they can't meet it for some reason or there's, you know, some outbreak, if you will, of, of some something gets through or hasn't been removed properly, then you get a uh, you get informed by your water supply. They're required to do that by law, but private well owners none of that occurs. So the way this tool works is down at the bottom here it says enter your well test results. And if you click on that, it brings up this page, and right above all the boxes it says anonymous in New Hampshire town or city. If you dry, click that drop down, it gives you a list of communities. Many communities, small communities in New Hampshire, which is mostly small communities, uh, the whole state. Um, have private wells in their jurisdiction or in their city limits. And so um, this information really helps New Hampshire understand the scope of the problems they have with their water quality around the state by people who put their sample results in. Not only are they getting advice, but then the state also has the data. So if you're not in New Hampshire and you're not in one of those communities, you should use anonymous. Um, because you're allowed to do that as well. So I went in and did that. I typed in anonymous and then I uh, said 15 parts per, per billion or in, uh, micrograms per liter. And I left this up with the unit differences because most labs report everything in milligrams per liter. M MG, uh, the one below it that's not highlighted, instead of micrograms. So the health standard is 10 micrograms per liter, which is 0 0.01 milligrams per liter. If you're not paying attention to the units and you put in the wrong thing, um, it you know you're going to make a uh, three decimal mistake, and it's going to look a lot worse than it is, or a lot better than it is, depending on how that goes. So the advantage of this website over any of the others out there is they give you the option of converting the units based on what's on your lab report. And so again, some labs report everything in milligrams per liter, so this would say 0.015. Um, some labs don't. They provide a variety of units depending on what constituent it is. Um, and so um, I guess to clarify this a little bit, that's an important thing uh, more than you realize because if you have to convert it yourself, uh, a lot of people just make mistakes doing that. And as an example, we put a question, you know, so when you take the private well class, the 10 lessons, the first thing you're emailed is a pretest. I think it's 11 questions or 15 questions that just try to gauge your knowledge and the idea is you'll take the same test at the end after you've went through the 10 lessons and you potentially or hopefully will score better. And that's what we wanna see. And that's what we report to the people who fund us is that you know the, the average score was 
you know, 60% beforehand and it's 80% after, you know, whatever. Um, and that's what, what we have to do to help maintain our funding. Um, but it's important for you to realize too that if you the questions you miss, they're things you should know. Um, and so um, we ask one question and ask people to convert units. You know, we give them an example. It's like, I don't remember what it is, but it's like 0.1 milligrams per liter and you have to convert it to parts per billion. Well, that would be 100 parts per billion. 27% um, get that question right out of the probably 6,000 people that have taken that test and uh, for us. And, you know, I'm sure some just put an answer they didn't really care. Um, but, you know, it, it's telling that converting is not a simple thing. So having these units that you can go in and make sure it matches what's on your lab report is an important thing. So spent too much time on that, but I wanted to make it clear. And I didn't fill anything else out here because I just made this up uh, so I could show you what it does. So what it, when you click on that, it'll, it tell you it's got a red X, arsenic. It's above the health standard, which is 0.01 milligrams per liter, and it converts it for you. And so um, the other thing it does that's an advantage is it tells you the kinds of treatment you can use. So for arsenic, you can use a point of use um, absorptive media, or you can use RO. And that's what they recommend. So as you scroll down this page, I can't remember if I have that in here or not, I do. Um, it tells you that the treatment options here, the last box is the treatment options are either ANSI NSF standard or NSF ANSI standard 53 or 58. So there are third party organizations, NSF, which is not the National Science Foundation, it's the National Sanitation Foundation. Um, UL, you see that on light bulbs, right? UL, Underwriters Labs, and the Water Quality Association, um, WQA, they are third party certifiers. So companies that make treatment equipment can send their devices to these certifiers and they independently test them. And if they meet the standard, they'll get a label that says they meet these standards. NSF ANSI standard 53, if it's an absorptive media, which is like a filter cartridge you put on your kitchen tap, and an RO unit that a lot of times goes under your sink is under standard 58. You wanna use a treatment device that has one of those labels that has a WQA gold star, gold seal, uh, a UL symbol, or an NSF symbol. Because if you don't, um, it's not been tested by someone who's uh, not biased. And it may not work as well as it's uh, purported to do. But if it's got one of those standards on it, it should. It means they've tested it and uh, they it's met the criteria. And so um, that's an important thing if you do have to add uh, treatment. Uh, to recommend if you when you take our class our lesson 10 the last one is all about sample it's all about treatment and it talks about the different types of treatment some are not used that much today you know like distillation but they can be depending on specific instances and needs um, but they talk a lot about certification and you know two two treatment systems that are met that meet ANSI standard one meets ANSI standard 53 for removing arsenic and one doesn't maybe a five to ten times difference in cost so you're gonna be tempted to buy the one that's 10 times cheaper, but you get what you pay for, okay? Um, again, these are tools, they're a guide, and for typical waters. We find a lot of odd things in groundwater. Sometimes, you know, we found an area near Chicago where the pH is over 12. It's hard to believe it exists naturally. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's all because of man-made issues from uh, the last 100 years, but that's what the groundwater is at today. And so, you know, if you were in that area, one, you really couldn't drink the groundwater, but it's just an example of, you know, typical results are for typical water. And go to your health department and ask. They may know some things, especially if you're in an area that, you know, has beryllium, they're going to know that because it's an odd thing. It's not typical and talked about a lot around the country. So they're the health professionals. That's who you want to go to to make sure your water is safe to drink for your family's health. Um, and again, in 99% of the country, they can't tell you to stop drinking your water or condemn your well. They can only recommend that you do those things. Um, but if you're worried about whether they can, you know, there's a there's a couple water health districts in Massachusetts, for instance, that have the authority to condemn your well. Um, if you're worried about that and you don't want to take a sample to them because of that could happen, call them first. Say, ask what their rules are. Do you have the authority to tell me I can't drink my water if it's bad? And if they say yes, then find someone else. And if that's if you're concerned, I, you know, that's both good and bad advice. I'm probably going to get uh, some heat for that. But I understand, too, um, you want to take care of your situation and make sure your water's safe. So find someone who can give you that uh, professional advice, 
even if it's from a different health district um, or a state office. Um, all right. Poor well construction, that's that's probably the biggest problem. Matter of fact, the two problems in, in my belief, and this isn't to say anything negative about well owners, I'm, I was one myself for a while, um, but a lot of people don't take the time to really understand their wells. The two biggest problems with private wells are either they're old wells that weren't properly constructed to the code they have today, um, or the well owners aren't equipped and haven't taken the time uh, to become good stewards of their well. They don't understand what they need to know and have the knowledge they need to take care of their well. Those are the two biggest problems. So co correcting poor well construction is a huge part of that. Um, we see a lot of older wells. You buy an old home in the country or you've, you know, your family's been on this farm for 150 years. The well still works. You're still using it. But if it's like the one I grew up on, it's completely unsafe. We still see wells in pits, which um, before the advent of the pitless adapter in the 60s, which was developed so that you keep the water lines under the frost line in colder climates, wells were dug into pits. And the top of the well was three or four feet below ground surface in a pit so that it wouldn't freeze. Um, those can fill with water during a rainstorm, animals, snakes, rats, you name it, can get in there. If your well's not perfectly sealed, it can flood. All those things are still a problem. Um, I did some work out again in Tazewell County and we found over 40 wells out of about 1,500 in nine townships that still were in pits today. Um, and you know, our recommendation there is you bring that up to the surface and get rid of the pit. Not only is it a danger for your well, but it's a danger for you and your family. Um, people fall in, the lids aren't safe after a while. Um, it may be just a piece of plywood. We've seen tractors, everything else stuck in those. And so uh, they're definitely a safety hazard as well as a surface contamination hazard for your well. Uh, here's a couple examples. These are two of the worst ones. Um, the picture on the right, that's a dead goat. And uh, this is a well that's not in use anymore, but it's on an old farmstead in Southern Illinois. Um, but it's just got a, you can see the brick down there at the bottom. Uh, it's old, you know, the, the well's 150 years old. But someone took a concrete tile and uh, vertically put it on top of the well but it's still only um, about a foot above land surface and it had no cap. So uh, there's a goat farm nearby, a goat had got out. It found there was water there and tried to get in there and um, you can see what happened. Now, um, you know, that's an extreme example, but we see animals and wells all the time, um, including the one I grew up on. We had frogs in it. Frogs had gotten into it one time. And my dad's solution was to try to gig them with a, a chimney rod and get them out rather than actually clean out the well, uh, which we ended up cleaning out the well. But uh, this other case is from the Washington State Department of Ecology. They have a blog and they're the agency in Washington State that regulates drillers and well construction. And so they have a blog or did have when I took this picture down, it's been a few years ago, um, with examples, a bunch of them, of where people have fallen in a well or a well's not protected or livestock have fallen in a well. And in this case, there was a piece of plywood over this, uh, you know, the, it's a vertical corrugated pipe is the top of the wellhead, basically. And they just had a piece of plywood over the top. Um, it got old, it was damp on the bottom, I'm sure. And eventually a woman walked over that and fell in and it killed her. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of problems with this picture. You know, you see the old funnel, it's where they're putting oil into that pump. They just leave it sitting there. It looks like old insulation laying around the floor. You could see there's a wall there and an old broom. This is probably a small well house. And uh, so it's uh, meant to, um, yeah, so anything can fall in this well. And then the water eventually is being used with the whatever, especially insulation in it and other things. Uh, it's just a, you know, uh, and I get out of sight, out of mind sometimes, but this is really just, uh, no one should have a well like this. It's just really not safe to drink. So what do you do with these wells? If it's in a pit, you extend the pipe up to the surface and you fill it in with clay. Um, you know, and if you have to install pitless, like, you know, in Illinois where we have freezing weather, like today, I think uh, last night it got down to seven or six degrees here, um, you have a pitless adapter so that you can have the pipe going up to the surface, but you also have a connection to your water line going into your house well below the frost line. And you can talk to your local well authority. Um, if you have one, a uh, contractor, your county extension, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that can help you, your health department. Um, and deciding what to do to bring your wealth and make it safe.
So the same thing with abandoned wells. So I mentioned earlier that we only have about 50 or 60% of the wells on file for wells that are actually in use in Illinois. We have about 500,000 well logs and we believe there's between 720 and 800,000 wells based on a couple of different types of estimates. Um, but there are also a ton of wells out there that were never on file and aren't used anymore. You know, you buy a property in a country with an old home, you tear it down, you build a new house, you put in a new well, but you leave the old well, either because you don't know it's there or because you decide you're gonna use it for your garden for a while and then that goes by the wayside when you realize it's not that much water. You know, a lot of things happen, but we have probably as many abandoned wells that aren't being used um, as there are wells in use out in rural areas. And they're really a safety hazard. And they're also a potential source of contamination. You know, we've even seen where people use those um, to as to throw trash in. And it's it's a, a well that's going into, could be going into the same aquifer you're getting your drinking water from. So you need to abandon those, properly abandon them, which means fill them in with something that won't let water through, like cement or clay. And uh, you know, if someone's on your property, even if they're not supposed to be, and they fall in an old well, um, you know, you, you're gonna be liable. So there are safety risk and insurance risk as well. Um, there was just a story last fall, I think, where a guy was um, doing something with his subdivision, or no, he had a, um, an extension on his house and had a buddy helping him and uh, he fell through the floor and uh, fell into an old well. So the people who'd bought the property before, and the well dated to the 1860s, I think, but this guy fell in a well, he was fine in the end, but it, they built the addition over the well and never sealed it and just left it there. And so um, that wood had gotten rotten and the guy fell through the floor. And so, you know, those, you can say these things are not gonna happen to you, but you just never know. Um, we run into a lot of cases where wells are in basements or in garages or under garages and uh, or, you know, in the house um, because that's what they did at the time. And, uh, you know, now it's not a safe procedure. And if you have one of those situations, you should try to correct it. And here's just some more photos. The two pictures are both, again, from the uh, Washington State Department of Ecology. A horse fell in an old well and they're getting him out. And another guy fell in his a well in his backyard. Um, and this is a well that was in his backyard. It wasn't his well he was using, um, and he fell 45 feet and he walked away. So very fortunate. And that was in 2013. And all these newspaper clippings are from uh, way back, you know, in the 90s, between 93 and 97, I believe. But the third one, if you're old enough, you remember Jessica McClure. Uh, she fell in a well. She was 18 months old, um, you know, Texas. It was covered uh, live on CNN for, I don't know, 26 hours or something like that. Um, while they tried to dig her out, and uh, they did. She sung while she was down in there. She was happy-go-lucky. You know, she's a mother today. Of, of, she has several kids, grown up, um, but that made national news. Um, so it happens more than you think, um, and you don't always hear about it. And I show these newspaper clippings because, you know, back in the 90s, you didn't get your news fed to you on your phone. Um, you know, people still relied on the newspaper. And what I, the three other articles here, one's um, in Buffalo Grove, which is a Chicago suburb, the other is, um, oh, where was that at? Galesburg, which is in Western Illinois. And then Sangamon County is uh, the Springfield area is the middle of the state where the state capital is. I guarantee you the people in each of those regions never heard about the other two, where today you probably would, um, or at least some people in our profession would, where people have fallen in these wells. And, you know, they, they kill people. And so uh, it's an important thing to take care of, not only that aspect, but realize that an old well like that can cause contamination of the aquifer you might be using for your water supply. So um, I want to talk a little bit about our class, um, just so everyone's aware. Um, again, it's it's 10 lessons. It's self-paced. You're on your own to take it. You sign up for the class, and it sends you one lesson a week for 10 weeks. It's a PDF that you'll get in the email. You're on your own to read it. You're on your own to do anything about it. Um, you know, we, we aren't following up, per se, except there's a post-test at the end to ask you if you've done anything. Um, you know, and even on our class page or on our web page, we have other resources that support each of those lessons. But it's a it's a great resource for you to have to understand the basics of taking care of your well. So this is our front page. If you go to privatewellclass.org and you just click on the button that says take our free class or on the button on the bottom left, that says learn by email and then you sign up. Um, and I guess I didn't include the sign up page. I thought I did. I guess I didn't I'm gonna back up here. Um, 
so yeah, um, you sign up and just ask for your email address, your first name, and what state you live in. And again, that's because we're grant funded. So what that means is we have to show the folks that fund us that we actually are doing some good in the world and people are taking our class from all over the country. And so it helps us uh, and that's why we ask that. Um, I mentioned there's lessons to support, there's resources to support each of the lessons. The first lesson is called the science of groundwater. And in support of that under resource library, there's these this information. You can click on any one of those bulleted documents from other sources that we've vetted and represent information about what's in the lesson, the, tin, uh, the science of groundwater lesson. And you can learn more about groundwater hydrology or uh, a well owner's handbook. Those things are all useful information. Um, and so, you know, just like groundwater and well contamination, the first resource there is the Michigan Flow and Well Handbook. So, it, you know, Michigan's an interesting story. Um, they have so many flowing wells, which means the pressure in the aquifer is enough that when you poke a well into an aquifer, the water level rises above land surface. So those wells flow. Um, and they had so much water that they were losing, groundwater they were losing because of areas where there was uh, flowing wells that they require you to cap those now. And you have to have a special type of cap that's pressure, pressurized and keeps the water in. And it basically, you know, if it's enough water pressure, it can act as your pump um, because it's gonna force water out and you open a faucet and that sort of thing, just like your pressure tank would do and, and that sort of, so it's kind of a cool thing. They were losing 28 million gallons of water a day uh, from groundwater that was just running on the ground uh, for flowing wells. And so they decided to do something about that. Um, okay, we also have webinars that we record like today's. So this webinar is being recorded and by next week sometime, it'll be up on our website. Um, this is a webinar from uh, July and it was on septic systems. We do one septic webinar a year. You know, our grant's really about wells, not septic systems, but we realize the role septic systems play both in contamination and in being a good steward of your well and your septic system if you have both. And so um, we bring in a septic expert who's with RCAP and he's uh, in Massachusetts and he helps answer our qu the questions we get because uh, we certainly have, uh, don't profess to be experts, just enough to be dangerous related to septic systems and how they work and all those sorts of things. But there's a lot of good basic information here um, and we do several of these targeted uh, types of webinars as well. Um, we, we did this twice. We did it once in 2016 and once in 2018. If you're concerned about lead and you have an older home that has lead pipes, you can go on our webinars and events page, go to past webinars and scroll down to August 22nd, 2018, and you'll find this webinar. We actually brought in an expert from Virginia Tech who's done a lot of great research on lead, both in community wells and uh, in community water supplies and in, with private well owners. Um, and again, it's mostly about the plumbing in your home. All right, so it, it walks through what they found and what you need to be concerned about and also answers a bunch of questions. Um, we also create a lead page. It's just privateoilclass.org slash lead and we have several pages like that. Um, but this one is a, uh, to sources, again, like from um, CDC or US EPA and you know, Dr. Kelsey Piper, the, the first bullet under the second heading there is lead in private water systems. Uh, Kelsey is the person who did our, helped us with our webinar. She's uh, done a ton of research. Uh, she's now at Northeastern University, but still continues to work on these issues. And she was at Virginia Tech at the time. But uh, it's a webinar that's recorded and online that we found of hers. And uh, so we've linked to that as well. So there's a lot of good information on our webpage that can help you with specific topics. We also have, this says 16 because this is an older screenshot, but up, up under categories, the first one is training videos. Um, I think there's 19 or 20 of those now, but you know, even things like sharing a well. Uh, one thing that I knew a few people shared wells, you know, in Illinois, but I didn't realize how uh, predominant it was. There are a lot of issues related to shared wells that come up whenever there's a problem, a pump fails, there's a water quality issue. If you don't have something in your deed uh, about sharing a well, or you don't have a written contract and agreement among the users of that well, um, you're at risk. Maybe, um, you know, we see a lot of cases where originally it was a farm and as the father got older, the parents got older, they built two or three other houses for their kids who were also gonna help farm. And then eventually um, one son or maybe stayed and is farming all the ground, all the others left and they've sold those properties. Well, if you're not on the house that's got the well and someone buys that, um, the owner of that well and the owner of that property can just decide they're not going to share it anymore. 
And so we see this also, there was a time, you know, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act requires any, uh, what's considered a public water supply is any supply that has over 15 homes or 25 people. So we saw a lot of contractors um, building subdivisions and areas in more rural areas like that, where they put a well in every five houses because they're trying to skirt that rule because they don't want to be a, a regulated public water supplier. We have to have a licensed operator and all that stuff, but they don't realize what a disservice they're doing to the five homeowners that have to share that well. Sometimes there's not enough water in some of these aquifers. Um, there's a lot of issues or there's, you can't pump enough to have enough pressure. Um, so this is just one example of the type of videos. This video is actually only four to six minutes long, um, but it talks about some of the basics you should know. And, I go into all these stories because we've dealt with a lot of people who are on a shared well and have had these issues. And it's a good way when you maybe had a neighbor for 15 or 20 years and you're fairly close to all of a sudden not being good neighbors anymore um, if you don't have this taken care of properly. So it's, it's worth your time to understand those things. Um, we show this video mainly because it's the most popular one we have. Why does my well keep losing pressure? We realize that there's not a lot of good videos out there that explain pressure tanks and how they work and um, that there's a lot of folks on private wells who have poor water pressure. Um, and so, you know, I think this video has had over uh, 370,000 views in four years. And so I guess five years now, but um, it's uh, something you should know. You should understand what your pressure should switch does. And we see them set at 20 and 40, where maybe if they can handle it, they should be set on 40 or 60. It gives a lot more water pressure, especially if you have a two or three story home, you know, it's not gonna have the same pressure on the third floor because all the pressure is going to lift in the water uh, to get it up there. And so understanding how that stuff works, just the basics is a good, uh, good thing if you're uh, on one of these systems. We also have a podcast if you're into those things. Um, we've only actually recorded uh, the first three lessons of the 10. It's actually uh, really difficult to make some of those concepts clear uh, just uh, by talking about them without being able to show a figure or a diagram. And it's, uh, it's, it's been a challenge for me, I'll just be honest. And so well, we haven't got past three of those, but we also have uh, done some work with RFD Illinois, which is the Farm Bureau Radio Network, um, where they've asked us to come in and do interviews basically about private well issues. And they graciously allowed us to put those uh, recordings on our website as well. And so if you're into it or you have a commute every day, or, you, know, it's, you can always learn something from every one of these. They're all a little different. Um, our entire class is in Spanish. If you're a um, if you're an EHP on here today, or someone who's a professional that works with well owners, um, we encourage you to share this. If you have uh, fluent Spanish speaking or first language Spanish speakers in your uh, area, um, we this doesn't get a lot of traffic. Probably eight or ten folks take it a month uh, or uh, every three months. Um, but you know we're trying to get the word out about it. It is available, and there certainly are areas um, in most every state where there's uh, a lot of folks who don't speak very good English either came from another country or um, uh, came here young and uh, you know, Spanish is their first language. So we recommend uh, that. Even the figures and stuff have been done in Spanish. And so everything should be uh, as comprehensive uh, whether you take it in English or Spanish. So the goal of our program really is to uh, give well owners advice and information that help them understand why their well is important, why they need to understand how it works so that they can really help protect themselves and their family from risk. And so, um, you know, that's the goal. And um, I think if you go through the lessons, they'll be helpful to you uh, in whatever you do. And we have even professionals contact us. And sometimes I just had a driller contact me about some bacteria issues he's uncovered, things I didn't know. And I'm actually going to have him talk at our conference which we're having a conference in May, a virtual conference for professionals. It's not for well owners, it's for professionals who serve well owners. And uh, there's some really interesting things about how complicated that really is and why sometimes, um, you know, when you disinfect a well in a water system, it may not take. And uh, there's a number of reasons why that occurs. And so we try to bring in experts or folks who've lived through it and have that experience like this driller from Northern Illinois um, who can talk more about it than I can. And I learned something when he called me and we had an hour long conversation about some of the things he's seen in the field. So we can all learn, we all keep learning and uh, that's what I encourage you all to do. So we did get a ton of questions. Uh, we do every webinar as these have grown in popularity, especially since the pandemic started. Um, we obviously can't answer all the questions. 
And I'll, I'll bring this up at the end, but we do answer a number of questions and I'm gonna go through those next. And what I recommend you do is go back through our past webinar recordings and skip to the end where the questions are. You're gonna see some different questions. You're gonna see some of the exact same question answered every time. Because when you know a third of the people who ask questions ask about sampling or testing, we're gonna answer those questions because there's a lot of you on there today. But some one-off questions we may have answered before. And so if you go and do the legwork to look at our other videos, you don't have to watch all the content in the beginning, especially if it's like this video, the last time we had it, uh, this particular webinar was in August. But if you go to that August recording, you're gonna see different questions answered or some of them are different than today. And so um, you can learn just by going through those rather than having to wait for me to possibly answer it today and find out that I didn't get to that one. Um, and so, um, and I'll show you that at the end. I, I was going to go through some screenshots, but I think I'm just going to show you um, how to do that because it's a lot simpler and you can see what I click on and all those things. So um, first question, and we get this question every webinar, not this particular one, but how do I learn about how to take care of my well um, is the bottom line. And, you know, our class lessons, the 10 lessons I keep talking about, walk through that. Best practices, what you need to do, um, what you can do yourself, what you should try to find a contractor for, what you need to know. Um, we can't go through all of that and to answer those questions. So the first thing you need to do is take our class. Um, it's free to you. Um, you have the material at the end. Um, it's really um, meant to help you. There's even a lesson. One of the lessons is lesson seven. It's called how to find local help and support. You know, um, I'm in Illinois. I know a lot about Illinois groundwater, um, but I don't know a lot about groundwater in some other states. Some I do, some I don't. But there are experts in your state. You just have to know how to find them. Even things like finding your well log. People are like, well, how do I find my well log? If you Google Missouri water well logs, you're going to go, the first three or four hits are all going to be Missouri DNR, which is who houses the well logs in the state of Missouri or Wisconsin DNR if you're in Wisconsin. Do some work, find it out, be investigative. You need to wanna to learn and you will. There's a lot more information available today than there was even five years ago. You know, the state of California, you, you could not get your well log from a county in California unless you were the owner of the well. And this happened, I had a well owner call me, I tried to get the information. In the end, he had to go to the county and get the information and fax it to me. This is like five or six years ago. Well, because of all the water issues out there, they passed a law and now all of that information is publicly available. I can go online, they have a tremendous database with all of the wells that they have records for. And so if you're in California, you can find your well log and all your neighbors, and you can look at all the information and see how typically wells uh, in your area, how deep they are, all that sort of stuff. Maybe your well is a 60 foot well and most of your neighbor's wells are 300 foot wells. It might mean that if you're having water problems every summer, it's because your well's shallow, and if you dug a well that was 200 foot, two or 300 foot deep and hit this other aquifer, you wouldn't have those water pro quality problems. And I'm not saying to base your judgment on that one factor, but it's worth asking then a contractor or your county health department, hey, I've got a shallow well, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, be willing to go out and do those things and you'll find out a lot of information. The other thing we get are, you know, these, is there a common maintenance schedule? I knew nothing about wells, um, you know, our, this webinar certainly will get you started, but again, take our class. And then once you've done that, you'll be better prepared even to sit in on these webinars, to be honest. And so it's worth doing. And again, the questions we get from you will be more directed questions that will be more relevant for more people than just, you have a maintenance schedule, um, you know, cause you should be able to find that stuff um, out there. Um, so yeah. And again, just go to privatewellclass.org um, I put the green uh, URL up there just so it's not, because it's I didn't uh, clip that on my screenshot, but you take our free class and it takes you to a page where you can do that. So um, there's a long question, but to summarize, we added an RO unit, and you know, as I showed in that example, RO takes out a lot of things, even the buffering that keeps water at a certain pH uh, sometimes. And now we're concerned about the loss of nutritional uh, constituents that the RO unit removed? What should we be concerned? And they asked specifically, you know, about osteoporosis and, you know, some of the things about bone growth and, and that stuff. And so, you know, I want to say again, we're not health professionals and you're going to start talking about diseases or conditions based on uh, the constituents you put in your body. 
you need to talk to your doctor or a health person, like an environmental health uh, office or your local health district. Um, we can certainly tell you what's considered unhealthy in a well based on the MCLs that EPA has established and that information is publicly available. But really that particular question is uh, for your doctor. What I would suggest though is, you know, your, you're gonna, your doctor's gonna wanna know or whoever is looking at your water quality data is gonna wanna understand what the water quality was before RO took everything out. And so again, I'd suggest collecting two samples and then you can see the difference and maybe there's another solution, or maybe you want to use, um, I know you're, you, you mentioned uh, the scale on like your coffee machine and that sort of stuff. Maybe there's a happy medium where you can, you know, you have one tap that's your RO water and uh, you use that for your, um, uh, your coffee maker, for instance. But it turns out your regular water without RO isn't such a problem for drinking as it much as it is for you know the scale problem you talked about and it's perfectly safe to drink then maybe that's what you use for most of your drinking water um you know and that's just one i was trying to think of a, a good way to answer this and provide some more information and that's the first thing i well, i thought of so um so we also got a question about drillers uh and i don't know for sure what state this was but the question basically was, there's many contractors who end up not installing the sanitary well cap at the top with a seal the way it's supposed to be. And it has something to do, they don't tighten the bolts, so it's not really sealed. And it's so that it gives them better access down the road, especially for the drop pipe or the, if they have a submersible pump. And so the question among other things was, do you recommend additional training for water well contractors? Um, you know, if there, there's a lot of, um, and I guess the first thing to say is, you know, in every industry, in every type of job, there are always going to be bad apples. Um, we run, in, you know, we have very few drillers who don't follow all the rules here, and I work with a lot of them. But there's one in particular that I know doesn't submit all his logs. And, you know, I could turn him in. Uh, he's an older gentleman, and I haven't. Um, I can usually get information from him, but he's, he's breaking the law, and in Illinois anyway. And whether uh, what your rules are in your state really matter here, because if, if they're under uh, under the law, they're required to provide a sanitary well cap and seal it, because that's the proper way to install a well, then you need to contact your state and have the state talk to them, because they're breaking the law. And no one should be allowed to do that, right? Um, if, especially if they're doing something that's not protective of health. And so um, your well cap needs to be sealed, especially if it's in an area where it could be flooded, um, any of those sorts of things where something could overtop it or things can get in your well. You know, I don't show in this webinar, but in another one I show a lot of dug and board wells and an old hand dug well uh, that's got boards over it with pieces of tin from a roof and then concrete cap, uh, concrete blocks for a, to hold it all down. You know, snakes, rabbits, you name it, can get in there and, and do and fall in those wells and die and now they're contamination uh, source. So um, I would contact your local estate agency about this, and then, um, and if they can't do anything or won't, or if, um, or maybe even the first step is to contact your state drillers association, peer pressure is probably the best thing to work on a driller, and they'll listen to their peers. Um, you know, and a lot of guys are set in their ways, just like I am, and so, um, Again, I do want to say most drillers are excellent at what they do and do things the right way. And you know, we work with a lot of drillers around the country uh, for this program, and also you know, for our conference, we have drillers come in and talk. And uh, they're the good apples for sure. Um, but they understand that we still have some guys who like to do things the way they've always done it, uh, and that's not okay anymore. Um, you got to do things uh, so that's protective. Uh, and sealing a well cap is a, a big issue. I know. New York, uh, I think it's Madison County, New York, got a grant from CDC to do some work to understand their private well issues better. And it's kind of not quite up to the St. Lawrence River part of New York, but it's up in upstate New York. And there's a lot of private wells. They found that um, many of their well caps weren't properly sealed and working like they were supposed to. And those typically were the wells that had contamination of some sort, um, most often coliform E. coli. So it matters and it needs to be sealed. And so um, you can talk to the driller first, if that's probably the, you know, the, uh, the more uh, correct way to handle it and say that if you don't do this correctly and if you do keep doing this to wells, I'm going to the state. 
or I'm going to go to the Drillers Association. I mean, the only thing you can do is put peer pressure on them um, or get them in trouble legally if you can um, because they need to do things the right way. Um, and yeah, we all need to speak out about it, I guess. And to clarify that, the driller I talked about is no longer in business, um, which is, you know, at the time I did not go to the state, um, but it's not an issue anymore because he sold his business about three years ago. Because uh, I realize I'm a little ambiguous on the way I answered that question. Okay, CO2 levels in well water, what are the acceptable ranges? What is normal? What is considered high? Okay, so um, CO2 and, and a number of these questions, especially water quality questions, I didn't mention. Um, my boss, who runs our groundwater section, his name's Walt Kelly, is a geochemist. And he has extensive experience with all of these things and understands uh, groundwater chemistry, uh, you know, 100% better or more than I do. And so um, he answered, his answered a number of these questions and I'm gonna read them, but uh, like this question Walt answered the first half and I added some stuff to the bottom half. Um, so you don't measure CO2 in water, you measure, um, it's inorganic carbon, so it's measured as alkalinity with CaCO3, um, calcium carbon I think is what that stands for. And it can range from 50 to 600, but and, and you know, he said it depends on geology, soils, recharge rates, all that stuff, what kind of alkalinity you're going to have. But in itself, it's not really a health issue, but it's kind of a measure of pH and the amount of alkaline minerals. And so um, the important thing is, you know, it's recommended that your well water be between 6.5 and 8.5. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule. You know, um, in Virginia, one of the reasons they have lead problems is because one of their aquifers, I think it's a Piedmont, um, is a deeper aquifer that has a pH of, natural pH of around five and a half. And so because the pH is low enough that the water can be considered corrosive on lead pipes and copper pipes with lead solder, um, they have more of an issue out there with lead and copper uh, in drinking water in homes because of, not because of the well, and the, but the pH sitting in, uh, you know, your water line in your home overnight and uh, because of its pH and its natural corrosiveness or aggressiveness, it's going to leach some lead or possibly copper. And so, um, you know, that's really the important thing here is you want to understand whether things are can cause corrosion or scale problems on the other end. You know, if it's too high, it can also start promoting scale formation. Um, and, uh, you know, the one thing I read from EPA is that if you're drinking a lot of water that's really high in pH um, or really low, it can uh, start messing with the natural pH of your body. I think that would probably take a lot of water. And again, um, that's for information. If you really have a concern about that, you need to go to a health professional. Um, I included this from a previous thing because, you know, bacteria problems are the most common by far. And uh, there's all these issues related to the shock chlorinating your well and all that stuff. So um, bacteria contamination occurs when a well isn't properly constructed, usually, or the well eats either that, and so it's coming from the surface, or there's a shallow source. So you could have a shallow well that, you know, like an old hand dug or bored well that only is getting water from a thin sand layer that's maybe at 20 feet. That sand layer could extend across your property, even if it's only a couple inches thick. Um, and that's going to be the source of most of your water in your well, because water flows through sand so much easier and quicker than it can clay or silt or other things. And so if your septic field is also discharging and it's getting to that same sand lens, maybe it's even a lot closer to the surface on the other side of your house or 100 yards away. Um, it could be that that's what's affecting it. If that's the case, or you have a feedlot, you know, for cattle or livestock of some sort, if that's the case, no matter how much you shock coordinate your well, it's gonna keep coming back because there's a continuous source, okay? Um, and, or if it's permeable geology, highly permeable or vulnerable like karst, you have sinkholes in areas where there's cars at the surface where people throw stuff down in them. Um, you know, there's dissolving rock is what those are. That's why you have caves in, you know, southern Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, to Tennessee, and other places. And those water can flow, flow freely through those large fissures in the rock, and they can travel long distances, and somewhere they're generally connected to the surface, so you're getting surface contamination. Um, the other example would be is if you don't, if you have a crack casing, um, I won't mention those examples because it's already 2.30 here, um, but things can crack your casing like a tree root, or there's also studies that show that grout doesn't always stay in place like it's supposed to, so maybe there isn't grout everywhere around your well like you think it is, even though it's properly constructed. 
And the other thing is not having a sanitary cap, which we've already talked about. So all those things um, matter and you need to understand all that, which is why you need to understand your well construction geology and where your water source is coming from. Um, so we're gonna talk about how to disinfect your well, but uh, the part of that after you've done that is to retest to ensure the bacteria are gone. And if you do have a bacteria hit, um, and you've only tested for coliform, you should test for E. coli, um, and then you need to treat your water um, either once and see if it's gone, or if you treat it several times and it doesn't go away, you may need to add continuous disinfection as a treatment option in your home so that the water coming in your house may have bacteria in it, but the water going through your pipes after the treatment system has chlorine or has been disinfected with UV or whatever so that you're not having those issues. And some other things to consider, chlorine is used so commonly, and I just learned this a few years ago, and there's some folks actually working on some best practices for this. We don't have the information yet to share, but if you're in a pH environment above H for your natural, eight above, for groundwater that's natural, chlorine just doesn't work as well. It doesn't, uh, doesn't oxidize, it doesn't kill things like it, it should. And so um, if that's the case, you know, you have to use a lot more chlorine uh, than you, is recommended and it may not be effective, and so you may have to look at alternatives. Um, there may be a local source, like I mentioned, a septic system or livestock, and if you do, then you're gonna need continuous uh, disinfection. Um, the other things you can do, none of those are great. If, it's, if it turns out it is something near the surface, it's because your well is old or improperly sealed, try to bring it up to code and properly seal it, and that might solve the problem. That's uh, the next step. And then the only other option, besides adding continuous treatment, uh, disinfection would be to drill a different well into a different aquifer if the source is something that's getting into where your water's coming in, uh, your aquifer or shallow sand lens or whatever it might be. And that's just the way it is. So um, about well disinfection, you know, we hear all the time, um, you know, somebody told me just to pour a cup of bleach down my well once a month. Bad idea. So it is an oxidant and as an oxidant, it also can leach metals. So if you have, you know, brass fittings on your pump, um, or pipe that um, you're pouring bleach on, um, or even you're in bedrock and you pour high concentrations of bleach, um, it can uh, leach metals out of the rock that normally wouldn't be leached out. And so it's really a bad idea. You need to follow a set of guides and you're mixing it a certain proportion. And so um, we've looked at a ton of guides on how to disinfect your well. And the one that we feel is the best is the one from Minnesota Department of Health. It's 10 pages long. Um, they've actually changed this and made it not as useful as it used to be. So we still have the old one that we link to on, under, um, you know, I showed those uh, groups of documents that are available for each lesson. Well, if you go to the group of documents for lesson 10, this is one of them that's listed there. And it's not the one currently on the MDH's website. It's the one they used to have on their website because it's more detailed. They've tried to make it a smaller document and doing so they've made it less helpful in my opinion. Um, because it doesn't have the detail. And it's worth the detail because if you're gonna do this, you wanna do it right. So this has step-by-step -step instructions. It tells you, you know, knowing the depth of your well and the diameter, how much to use to mix it. So you're getting uh, the right percentage of chlorine in the mixture, um, you know, and this should work most of the time. And it's the best approach that we've come across. But again, I mentioned the driller who'd contacted me a few weeks ago after our last webinar. He's run into cases and something I'd never considered. If your pump, let's say you have a 600 foot well, if your pump's at 200 feet, then when you start circulating water, uh, which is one of the things you do after you mix it in, you circulate it back into the well to make sure it's mixed at the same concentration, you're actually only mixing water a little bit below the pump, depending on where the water's coming from. It's possible that most of the water's coming from above the pump. In a, like in a bedrock aquifer, it could be a seam, uh, a crack in the bedrock that's above your pump, then the water down below is not gonna get chlorinated uh, in this that scenario. And so you need to consider that too. Um, and again, I don't have a better explanation for what to do there. We still think you should follow this for now, but we are gonna work on addressing that. Um, and hopefully, you know, down the road, we'll have some better advice um, for some things you can do. Um, they, I know what he does is they put a few um, of the small pea-sized pellets of chlorine and let them drop to the bottom, and that helps with that bottom part. But I, I haven't looked into that yet, and so I don't necessarily want to recommend anything until we've had a chance to uh, 
go over at all a little more and work with him a little more uh, in order to do that. But this is a, a this is the best approach that we have today. Um, again, if your pH is over eight, the coin may not be as effective, and so it might have it might not work um, as well, or it might take more chlorine. And sometimes there's also bacteria can grow in layers of certain types of bacteria, and they can harbor E. coli, even though maybe it's iron or sulfate reducing bacteria. Um, or, um, so one chlorination may kill the upper layer, but not what's underneath. And so it may take several times to actually get to all of those things, if that's the case, especially if you've never disinfected your well before. Um, who knows how long some of that stuff's been growing. Maybe it's the first time you've ever tested and you have a positive coliform hit. Um, you don't know if that's going to be a small problem or a big one. Um, one of the solutions there, too, is when you do the testing, try to get a plate count, not just a positive or minus or negative. Um, it's required. A lot of folks just do uh, positive or negative, whether it's, it's you know it exists or doesn't exist. But having a plate count of the bacteria is really important to understand. If it's a very small number, like under 10, then it may even been handling the sample incorrectly that caused that or something right at your faucet um, sloughed off or whatever. But if it's a higher number, if it's in the hundreds, then you likely have a bigger problem. And that value can get up into the thousands. So uh, a couple hundred isn't like scary uh, per se. We see thousands when you're talking about springs a lot of times. It even has advice, by the way, on what to do with your treatment equipment and whether you need to um, remove that before you do the disinfection. And it's got advice like to go to the Water Quality Association, which has information on a lot of the treatment devices on their website. Okay, so moving on, my well has iron in it. The water tastes terrible and stains my clothes. What can I do to improve it? You know, it's not, um, I don't think the, the iron's causing the taste. It certainly causes the staining. Um, and so what we recommend is start with a sediment filter, like a five micron filter. And if there's any iron that's already oxidized, it's going to catch it. And then um, you can also add treatment uh, to get the dissolved iron out by uh, oxidating it beforehand. And even softeners remove some. And so um, you, they do make softeners that are meant for high iron. And you might want to go with that. Um, but using an iron filter first certainly will help all any treatment equipment pass that with issues of iron building up or causing problems down the road, especially the oxidized iron. It's actually a particle. Um, and there's some other advice I mentioned here going to the Illinois Department of Public Health website. If you just Google iron and drinking water, um, there's sites near the top. And again, regarding taste, it's probably a lot of other things. Um, and you can also get filters that remove some of the things that cause taste and odor um, at your kitchen tap. Um, and we answered this question again back in uh, June on our webinar as well. Uh, so, again, I just want to point out that out because that's a, that's a theme here. Um, my water looks orange. What do I do to eliminate the color? Um, they've tried shocking the well to kill the iron bacteria, but it comes back. Well, iron bacteria uh, a lot of times use sulfur or sulfate as uh, their medium for food, and they... Um, give off as a, they expire then um, hydrogen sulfide, which is the rotten egg smell. And so they're not causing the color. It's iron and iron oxide that cause that orange color. And so you'd need to do what we just mentioned in the last uh, question for that. Um, and sometimes you do have water and water can look, um, I think I talk about that in a second here. Water can look a different color from other things. Yeah, okay. So, um, so this other question we got for this webinar was, does colored water, discolored water inherently unsafe to drink? Well, no, because as we mentioned earlier, it could be iron um, and a lot of things that are harmful are, don't have a color. And so you really need to test, but uh, silica is another thing that's common. And sometimes people don't like silica uh, because it gives it um, um, honestly an ur urine color in your water. And we just had a community that was going through this where their water was coming out that color and all the residents were up in arms. It's perfectly safe. Um, you know, silica is very common in the Earth's crust. The other thing that can be in water sometimes are tannins. And I don't know a lot about this. I know our lab guy had answered this question once before and tannins was something he brought up. Again, they're not really a health risk or they're not a health risk, but they can give water that light yellow to brown color um, as well as iron. Um, the thing is when you have iron, you're typically gonna have other things. And um, we see a lot of our iron uh, contamination in our wells here 
uh, like scale formation or the, the color you see in your tub or your sink um, also contains um, manganese. And you know, there's a lot of new research out there that shows that manganese does cause health effects. Right now, the EPA only regulates it as a secondary contaminant for taste and odor, or for, you know, there's primary contaminants, which are health effects, there's secondary contaminants, which are aesthetic. And manganese is considered an aesthetic, but it takes so long for the EPA to actually change those rules. Um, other, some states have already started regulating, regulating manganese, uh, and I know Canada is now regulating it because it, they believe it causes neuro, neuro, neurological problems. And so um, you want to test for those things, and you want to use the latest information um, that's available to you for that. So how do I eliminate that rotten egg smell? Well, it's hydrogen sulfide, and it's either due to natural reactions in bedrock, um, which can happen. There's sometimes sulfur or sulfate in bedrock aquifers um, that just has that, uh, the hydrogen sulfide smell or it's from sulfate reducing bacteria, which include sulfate reducing bacteria, iron reducing bacteria, and other bacteria that are harmless uh, health-wise uh, to you. Like the sulfate reducing bacteria don't hurt you to ingest, but, and they're ubiquitous. I mean, they're common in groundwater. They live in that environment. You know, they live in reduced conditions where there's not any oxygen. That's why they use sulfate and iron and other things uh, to grow. Um, so chlorine is the best way to get rid of that bacteria, and that's the most common type of why you have that smell. Um, the thing is, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes they can grow in layers, and um, it's, you might need to do that more often than one treatment, or it could be that uh, there's enough there that you can't get rid of it, and you need to uh, consider continuous chlorination. So the water coming in your home, again, would still have that uh, smell. Um, but you can treat it, uh, and the chlorination will help do that. You can also add, um, you know, you can add a, a tank in front of your pressure tank to vent off gases. And so when they get up uh, up to the surface and the pressure's gone, a lot of those things will come out of solution, just like methane does, and uh, you can vent that off. Um, we see a lot of homes where they have methane problems, but if you um, bring it up to the surface where the pressures uh, dissolve, methane comes out of solution, and you can vent it off. Some people even use it to eat their homes. Uh, we have an area in Illinois like that. And so um, I don't think you can do that. You certainly can't do that with hydrogen sulfide, but um, it's related to these bacteria, sometimes a combination of bacteria. And uh, again, um, you can find more information about this from Minnesota Department of Health and, uh, or Google why my water smells like rotten eggs. Uh, okay. PFAS. Um, so PFAS, uh, PFAS chemicals is kind of the common term now. Uh, they're per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. There's a whole class of them. They're used uh, for in clothing, for um, water retardant. They're used as Teflon, coating, you name it. There's there are literally thousands of uses. And so um, fire foam is the big one, you know, um, and, they're, and what Walt had said here is uh, they're very persistent and mobile in the environment. Um, I know I just read a story not too long ago about a home in the Northeast that caught on fire in a town. They were using some of their uh, fire foam, and within three or four weeks, they found uh, PFAS chemicals in a few wells that were nearby. Uh, I mean, close, like within three or four homes. Uh, so it's, you know, they're that mo mobile, if you will. Uh, the NGWA, the National Groundwater Association, has a document um, you can Google. Uh, on PFAS and private well owners um, that has some basic information. That's a pretty good source. Um, but testing is really expensive. Um, and it, it's again, like with pesticides, we'd recommend that you look at your situation first and understand your well and your geology and your location. So if you're, you know, right across the road is the end of an airport, um, you know, a lot of firefighting foam is used at airports, especially for training. Uh, even when there aren't that many fires anymore at airports for, you know, that sort of stuff. And so they're typically where we see that Air Force bases, um, you know, or, um, you know, you can look at a list. I think EPA has a lot of different, um, has a list of all the different things that you used for. And uh, we typically see it, you know, like 3M in Minnesota. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Health is one of the first state agencies to recognize PFAS as a problem. And nearly 20 years ago, they started working with 3M because they had a huge contamination plume from their plant. 
um, which is just north of the Twin Cities. And it's all been remediated now, or it's in the uh, most of it's been remediated and all that's been cleaned up, or at least the well owners have been given a safe water supply and things like that. But um, it's, you know, if you're near a plant that uses PFAS chemicals um, and it's been there very long, uh, it's something then to consider. Okay, so um, here's where I was going to go through these slides, and I'm going to go fast here. Um, our webinar is an events page, and I was going to show you some stuff, but instead, I'm going to pull over. I'm going to bring this down, and I'm going to pull over this and uh, go to our front page real quick. Let me um, move this down. Can't even see that, I bet. And make it larger. I want to make it larger here. Okay, so um, I mentioned several times about other questions. So you can go to webinars events here and scroll over it. And you can go to past webinars um, and you can get to all of our webinars. There's 76 of them today. Some of them are for environmental health professionals, some are for labs, some are for real estate agents, that sort of thing. Um, but to see these full screen, you have to go to YouTube. And so um, I'm gonna show you that real quick. Um, if you go to the bottom of our homepage, if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a YouTube link right here, uh, YouTube, privatewellclass.org, and we have a channel. You're welcome to subscribe to it. Uh, you don't have to. Um, you have to shut this off. It seems to show up every time and go up, uh, start automatically. But if you scroll down, you'll get the webinar recordings. If you click on that, you get to this page that shows all our webinars. And why isn't that any bigger? That's pretty small on your screen, I'm guessing. Oh, it went back to 100%. That's why. My fault. And if you scroll down, it starts with 20. These aren't in order, which Katie and I have to look at and figure out how to change this. But um, these are all of our webinars going back to 2013. But if you scroll down to the bottom, that's not making anybody sick. Um, you can see the last one we had was January 20th, Well Care 101, and they're all recorded. I'm going to go up to uh, February, uh, Water Testing and Treatment. And so um, if I click on that, it's going to bring up that video. And I'm going to stop it because you don't want to hear my voice going twice. And I'm going to make this full screen. Okay. So if I um, if I go back to the beginning, this is what that page looks like: water treatment and testing. And we did this webinar with APHL and the Water Quality Association. Both uh, Sarah Wright from uh, I think it was Sarah who spoke for them. Uh, she works at APHL spoke, and Eric Yegi from the Water Quality Association also spoke. And then we did a part of this too. But um, for the common webinars, like the one we're doing today, you can go back to August and see that same webinar. You're going to see the same, almost identical content for the first 40 minutes. But after that, we get to the same section we got to today. Um, let me get to it real quick. Right here, we get to this page that says submitted questions, right? And there was one of these today. After this, it's all questions that people ask. And so, you know, I'm kind of going through this fast because like somebody asked a question about home test kits. And someone asked, here's, someone asked about uh, treatment for hard or acidic water. Um, why am I not? Contaminant sources. I mean, there's a variety of things. I wanted to get to emerging contaminants. The, a year ago, this is what we talked about with emerging contaminants. And most of that was related to uh, PFAS compounds because you know, EPA is still working on methods for those. There's a lot of things that are still unknown. Some states are starting to pass their own rules. Um, but right after that, I know someone asked today about um, radon. There's about iron bacteria. There we go. So um, I didn't answer that today just because now we're up, up till 20, 10 to 3. But I have something on there that you, will give you everything you want to know about testing for radon if you go to EPA's webpage and what we have on it. So what I wanted to show you this for is you can do this for every one of our webinars and you're going to find different information. Uh, funding for treatment. You know, we did a webinar on that. So you should go to that webinar and look. Actually, there's not a lot of options unless you meet certain economic criteria to get loans or grants for uh, wells. But USDA has a 1% loan program that almost anyone's eligible for if they have a low enough income. You know, I have a lot of credit requirements is uh, what I mean by that. So I just wanted to show you that because uh, there's a lot of valuable information and uh, from 
that particular thing. So um, going on to our questions that were asked today, I'm gonna again make this larger so it's easier for everybody to see. Whoa, that was delayed, sorry. Okay, um, I have an old rural well that has been inactive for 10 years. I'd like to re-energize the well for drinking water. What are the steps I should follow to ensure the water is safe to drink? Well, first you need to, um, you know, your lines and everything else are gonna be, have stuff in them. If it's just been sitting there stagnant, um, any kind of temperature changes could cause some of the water to evaporate or disappear. Um, and so if there's air in there, now you have bacterial growth, all that stuff, you may need to replace all the lines. Um, yeah, you, you just have to test to find out. You mean you have to put a, you're probably gonna need a new pump. Um, even if it works, you know, you're probably gonna work with a contractor to uh, decide what's best, but you know, you need to get the mechanical parts working and then um, you know you're going to need to pump a lot of water to waste. Um, probably the I mean the well has not had fresh water in it for a long time. It's it's really a, a challenging thing to do and kind of depends on the situation. Um, but if the if the pump was already removed and the lines were sealed, um, you know it may be a better situation. Just you know then you could put in a new pump in line uh, and reconnect it, and it may be fine. Um, I still think you're going to have there's gonna be some stagnant line somewhere in that whole system that's gonna be potential for uh, bacteria growth or other things, um, but you can always pump that out. And uh, you know, I think one of the keys would be drawing a lot of water through it uh, and then test and test several times, to make sure that the water is actually safe to drink. Um, you know, the well, wells uh, are less likely to have, you know, like, as much bacteria growth, they certainly can, and, and I'm not an expert here. And so um, that's why I think you probably wanna work with the contractor, because it depends on whether it's a sand and gravel well versus a bedrock well versus an old hand dug or board well. Um, it's just, uh, it's a chance, you know, there's a lot of unforeseen things that could be a problem or happen. Not real helpful answer, I realize it. Um, yeah, where can I download the assessment? Um, Yeah, no, that's, uh, and you know, if you're setting this up for the people in your community, you know, contact me, we can work with you and help you there and can also even get you in touch with the right folks who um, can come in to your town and actually give a presentation to your well owners and all those things. And so, um, you know, uh, you know, let us know, we'd be glad to help. Okay, will a green sand filter get rid of iron bacteria and manganese that creates black ink type of substance in toilet tanks? Um, you know, I don't really know a lot about green sand filters for private wells. I know about green sand filters that are used for um, community water supplies, much larger tank filters. Um, and those certainly do help get rid of those things. Um, I'm just not familiar with them on that small scale. But I know even, um, I, did, I didn't show this slide, but we have one. Actually, I might have showed it in the beginning. There was a picture with one of the slides that showed, it looked like two paint rollers standing on end. One is white and one was totally black. Um, that's a five micron filter. Um, and the black stuff was a combination of iron and manganese because the manganese is what typically makes it black. But usually it's not by itself. Um, it's, it's both. You have iron and, uh, and it's not, it's not getting rid of iron bacteria, it's iron that creates iron oxide. So iron bacteria is a different problem and your sand filter is not gonna work on that because they're typically down in the well and they're causing hydrogen sulfide. Um, but I, I guess, you know, you'd need to ask a tr treatment specialist um, more about or contact the Water Quality Association about green sand filters because that's a little out of my purview. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for that. And I can call them if you'd like, you email me, um, I can uh, call them and, and get some more information. It's something we should probably have on hand. Is lead testing usually included? It depends on the lab, but yeah. I mean, I think, you know, our lab samples for people in Illinois at a reduced cost because it's partially state funded. And so um, lead is an extra $15 charge. I think our samples are like $60 for all the things I listed there before and uh, lead is an extra $15, but still, you know, if you're a private well owner and going to a private lab anywhere, it's usually closer to $200 for all the analysis um, for, 
for all the inorganics and metals, or maybe at least 150, depending on the lab. Um, and in those cases, usually lead is included, but not always. And you just need to ask that question, you know, what's included, make sure you know what constituents you're getting. Because a lot of them will have, uh, you know, this is a private well owner's kit, and uh, it'll include these things. Um, and so um, if you need to add things on, or if there's a different, you know, wherever they've got is a quote named kit, you can use that instead um, if you're looking for a little more comprehensive. But, um, you know, because lead testing, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, how can I find out how deep my well is? Well, you can contact your state agency and see if you can find a well log. Um, if you know who drilled it, or if one of your neighbors knows who drilled it, or the past homeowner know, drilled it, and you know they're still available to you, uh, you need to do a little investigation to try to find out those things. If you can contract the, contact the drilling company and they still exist, you should be able to get your well uh, from them, your log. Um, and that's how you find out how deep your well is. You can also have somebody um, drop a tape or something down your well that'll get you to the depth, but that's a slippery slope, um, especially if you have a submersible pump. You know, there's, uh, depending on how the wires are going down to your pump, it's usually in a, a pipe. If there's, uh, there's these three prong devices that help center that and keep it in the center of the well. Um, we've had even steel tapes without anything on the end get hung up in a well. And then you have to pull the pump and hire someone. And, you know, I know the two that I had to do, this was probably 10 years ago, but they cost, it cost me $500 a piece to get the pump pulled to get my steel tape out. And so, um, you know, there are ways to do that, but I'd have a contractor do it who, uh, you know, will tell you the risks and um, be responsible if they get their, if they get something stuck or they may say you have to pull the pump to do this and then you can just measure the depth. Um, that's really your only choices that I know of. Um, I, it's it's probably not worthwhile to take a chance yourself dropping a tape with something on the bottom that'll get it to the bottom. Um, I know some people have done that, but I really don't recommend it. So because it's liable to get stuck. Um, so what was the well website for the private wells water quality map? Um, if you're talking about uh, the Wisconsin one, um, just email us and I I can give that to you because I have to look it up. I don't have it readily available. Um, I'd have to look, uh, I mean, you can Google it and find it. If you just do um, Wisconsin DNR private wells or um, web map, you know, add web map to that, I bet you can find it. Um, is there a last question? No, okay. Um, yeah, if you email us at info at privatewellclass.org, I can send you that URL or any, anyone who wants it. Um, because that was for the state of Wisconsin. But you should be able to find those things just investigating uh, yourself uh, in, in your state to see if they have one of those things, because a lot of states probably don't yet, but a few do. Um, would arsenic be higher because there's more apple orchards? Well, not, I mean, so the what I brought up with Rhode Island is that they list areas where there's potential for groundwater contamination because of apple orchards that were around uh, before the 60s, when they still used arsenic as a pesticide on all those things. And again, enough of it was used that it's in the soil and it can be leached down into the groundwater. Um, all that would depend on the aquifer you're being used, like the aquifer that's under Champaign County where I live, um, it's buried below 150 feet of clay before you reach the sand and gravel aquifer. And uh, there's very little recharge. and um, it it take it would take you know literally hundreds of years for the water to reach. I mean it has been for the last hundred years too, right? So um, it really depends on the aquifer you're using, uh, the soil characteristics, how deep your aquifer is, how much arsenic was applied, um, all those things. And so it uh, you know it's it's just if you know there's an old apple orchard there, you should be aware that that's a possibility, and it's not. There's no reason not to go ahead and test for arsenic. So if it, like I said, if it's been around for the last 50 or 60 years uh, or longer. Um, do you know, can recommend about clo uh, chlorine, organophosphate, commonly found in pesticides along the same line as DDT? Ooh. No, I'd have to look that up and, and talk to someone probably in our ag department who has more experience there at the U of I. Um, we did a lot of uh, original pesticide work in the 90s 
uh, when EPA was starting to cancel pesticide registration in our state to look at vulnerable areas in Illinois. Um, and I did a lot of that field testing, uh, field sampling, but I wasn't uh, on the chemistry side. And so um, I would have to look that up, but um, we can uh, send me an email again, and uh, we can look into it um, and see if there's recommendations available. So, um, how do you know if a well is bedrock or sand point? Well, so a sand point is different than a sand and gravel well. Um, sand points are legal in some states. They should be in every state. It's something that you can buy at your farm and fleet or rural king and pound in the ground yourself. You see it on videos on YouTube about people who have a shallow water table and it's sandy soil. So they drive a sand point 20 feet, that's you know three inch diameter or two inch diameter pipe, and they get their water from that because your pump's at the surface. You just need to drop a line. There's no grout. Um, you're in a sandy soil, so everything from the surface can infiltrate in and get to your well. Um, they're not a safe water supply for water quality. Um, but to know whether your well is in bedrock or sand and gravel, again, you need your log, or you need to know more information about the geology in your area. You know, in upstate New York, I worked um, a number of years ago, I think 2015 or 16, bedrock's at the surface. So clearly all the wells there are bedrock wells, um, but that's not always the case. In some places, you know, bedrock could be 10 feet below surface. So they're still all bedrock wells. But like where I'm at, where uh, there's been three glaciations that have came through Illinois in the last million years, um, we have as much as 450 or 500 foot of clay, gravel, sand, and silt um, that's not bedrock. It's unconsolidated from glacial melt water. And so, you know, in glacial areas, bedrock could be much deeper. And so really the only way to know is looking at the log. And uh, the drillers typically include the geology on those logs. And so, because uh, I know we have a driller in Illinois that really annoys me because he's always drilled bedrock wells. So as his business expanded and he started going into areas where there was sand and gravel, he blows right through the sand and gravel, even if there's 40 or 50 feet of it and plenty of water to get to bedrock to put in a bedrock well because that's all he's ever done. And he's doing a disservice to those well owners um, because they could have a, a you know, 100 foot well that's just as good as the 300 foot well they have and it would have cost them a lot less money, but it's not illegal. And the folks who have those wells drilled by that guy um, need to know the difference in order to take care of that. So, um, you know, a lot of states do have their well logs available. Um, it just, and then that's happening more and more as time goes on um, because it's becoming more of a public health issue and all those things. So you'd have to have your log or know the driller who drilled it and ask them. When getting a water sample for testing for lead, I know that I should take the sample first thing in the morning after having not used the water all night. How long should I let the water run before getting the sample? Zero seconds, 10 seconds, and a minute. Well, if you watch the uh, video we did and also the Kelsey Piper's video on the work they did, you know, they took samples at different intervals to get a look. And certainly the water um, that's sitting in your pipes overnight is gonna be higher in lead. That's why, you know, early on, some of the advice was to let your water run for at least, you know, a couple minutes before you fill a glass of water. So in theory, that's not water that's been sitting in your pipes, but uh, that's not great advice just because it, it assumes a lot of things about how much water is running through your pipes, the size of your pipes, how long it takes for fresh water to actually get in there, all those things. And so, you know, it might be a good idea um, to take a sample you know, if it's, especially if it's just for lead, and I know this, uh, and this is what I would do, and I'm not saying it's necessarily a best practice, but I'd want to know. Um, I would take a sample zero seconds and another one at a minute and then another one at 10 minutes and while the water's running the whole time and see what the differences are um, and just try to get a feel for if it's, you know, if it's the first two have higher iron or higher lead and the third one doesn't, then you know that it is totally your pipes and you just need to let the water run or you need to add something at the tap to get rid of lead. Um, or the other option there is if your water is corrosive or aggressive and it's actually leaching lead, there are things you can do to your water uh, before it enters your house, even to raise the pH, um, you know, 
and that's that's another option. You need to talk to a treatment professional about that. But the other side of all that is just because you have lead pipes doesn't mean that you're getting lead in your drinking water. If the water's got a higher pH, like that one that I showed you where the pH was eight, um, they have never had any kind of lead issues or copper issues because if the water's not aggressive and not corrosive, you don't leach any lead. In fact, it, it creates scale. And so once it's created scale on the inside of the pipe, then, you know, unless the scale sloughs off and it's got lead in it, um, which I don't think that's the case most of the time, um, then your, your water's not even touching the lead anymore, part of the pipe. And so it really, you know, it has to be sitting there overnight and also be aggressive water. So getting a water sample, um, even if you just do whichever one of those you do, um, and again, I'm not the expert, so I would look at those videos first. Um, but also having a water sample of all your constituents, including your pH and alkalinity and chloride value and everything else, um, will help. You know, someone like my boss could tell you whether that's aggressive water or not, and it's for risk of leaching lead. So that's uh, that's the kind of folks you want to talk to. Um, so why does Penn State recommend 14 months instead of 12 months? I thought I mentioned this, but um, you know we've always just said annually because it's a good thing to do every year. You can put it on your calendar, all that stuff. Penn State started recommending 14 months because so the first year you collect it in January, the next year it would be March, the next year it would be uh, May, then July, then you know September, and so over time you're actually collecting that sample uh, in different seasons of the year. And um, the idea is some places, especially shallow aquifers, shallow wells, really shallow wells that maybe are getting water from the water table, season matters. You know, uh, pesticides and nitrate are applied in the spring most of the time now. Um, you know, if you're in a place that freezes in the winter, you're gonna have less infiltration, even if, like from a feedlot than you would in the summer or in the spring when everything's wet. So there's a, you know, there's some logic to that as far as um, it gives you, it can give you some other information. Um, you know, the other option is to test more often uh, or maybe for two year sample every quarter. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways. It's just, that's what they did. I thought it was an intriguing approach and it does get to that issue of seasonality. And so, um, cause we do see some constituents like where we sample wells regularly, not private wells, but like our own monitoring wells we certainly see some seasonal difference in some constituents or have in the past. Um, you know, things are less active. You know, bacteria are less active in the winter, right? Um, matter of fact, a septic tank that's shallow enough that cold weather will affect it. If it's a seasonal home, um, a lot of the bacteria are likely to, to not be very active or even alive if it's been off for so long and it all actually got that cold because it slows them all down. And so some things certainly can matter. So. Um, okay, I arrived late. Any words uh, organic to, for, for PFAS? Um, there are methods, and they, I know the NGWA document lists some common methods for removing PFAS chemicals. Um, it's not, there are treatment, there is treatment for it. It's not that it's, I mean, they are small, but there is treatment. Uh, communities, uh, there's already communities that have to use treatment for it. Uh, they're still learning a lot about all the different types of PFAS chemicals. That's one of the problems. There's so many of them, there's hundreds, um, and some of them actually act differently. They have different chemical makeup uh, where certain treatment may work on one, may not work on another. Some aren't even detectable yet. Uh, they don't have all the methods developed. I mean, it's an evolving field, uh, honestly, with PFAS but all the basic ones and the most common ones. Now, I know several states have passed their own rules because the EPA hasn't yet on what's limited in community water supplies. And if your state hasn't, if Massachusetts hasn't, then um, you can look at what other states have done. Um, I would talk to DEP. Um, those folks are up on it. I, I, we work with them actually a lot uh, in Massachusetts and, um, and I can certainly reach out to them as well um, if you wanna send me an email and get you more information, okay? Oh boy, okay. I'm considering getting a new well, either a three inch well with a deep well above ground pump 
or a five inch well with submersible pump? Is there any upside to the deep well above ground pump or the submersible pump? And, you know, this is a question for someone who installs these things. Um, you know, it's easier to work on a, a above ground pump. Um, you can have a smaller well with an above ground pump. Um, I'm not sure there's probably energy differences and there may be amount of water pump differences. It may take a lot larger pump to do if you um, have your pump at the surface. Again, you know, I'm, I've not worked in this field particularly. And, um, you know, I would contact a contractor who installs both because some contractors are used to doing one or the other, um, you know, and they're going to lean that way. That's who they have their agreements with, with pump companies in order for the pumps they use and those sorts of things. The downside to not having your well in your pump, not in the well is um, well. And it sounds like that's not a downside. Never mind. You know, you can have a suction pump. That's just one line that goes down and actually can suck water without having the two lines where it's pushing water down. You know, uh, above ground pump has to be primed um, if it if it stops working, um, those sorts of things. There might be some hands-on maintenance issues there. Uh, again, um, if it's not a suction pump, it's, if it's an actual, uh, you know, you're pushing water down to lift water up, it's two lines, those can be very deep as well. Just like, a you know, most of the time you're putting an, a pump in a well when it's, deeper water levels um, just because, you know, it's it stays primed automatically basically because it's under the water uh, and that sort of thing. But I would talk to someone, uh, a contractor, about those options and what's better, or maybe even a pump company. Um, if you find one that has both, they can, you know, hopefully they'd give you some decent advice about where would, one would be better than the other. Yeah. Um, how do I properly abandon a well? A very old well pit that is lined with brick. Well, most states have a, a code on how to do that. Um, and most contractors understand how to do that. Um, you can look up the code in your state and you want to follow those rules. We actually um, participated in a well sealing demonstration and had a driller who volunteered his time and the, the bentonite to help fill in. The, uh, we provide the gravel, he provided the bentonite clay and he provided all the labor because they, they do these all the time. And we made it a demonstration for some of the health departments in Western Illinois. Um, that video is on our web page. Um, but again, he was following the code in Illinois, which requires layers of clay, then gravel has to be completely sealed. All the equipment has to be removed. Um, yeah, and the other thing I'll say is some soil and water conservation districts or other groups, county, um, boy, what's the uh, some groups may have a cost share program at a local level. Um, and I believe in Illinois, the Soil Water Conservation Districts did before all this stuff happened with our budget in the state, where they would cover up to half of the cost, um, up to like $750. And, and it depends on where you live, but in some cases that may be, you know, may only cost $750 total. Um, I even heard a guy uh, tell me they, they charge $500 for it but in some areas it's several thousand. And so, you know, it all depends. You can certainly get quotes and ask, um, but then you can also look up the code yourself um, or find out if you have a code. If you don't, then I would use one from a state that does. Um, and we can probably find those for you if you want to email us. Um, and it'll tell you, you know, what the requirements are, how full it's got to be, how you've got to seal it, um, if it, what material you can use, whether it's concrete or clay or whatever. Um, but the idea is you're creating an impermeable seal in the well so that nothing can get through. And like if it's not a large diameter well, which is what I had in my mind when I answered this question, if it's a, a say it's a steel well that's six inch casing or, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, a steel cased well or a PVC cased well, um, the only other caveat there is once you fill the well in, you have to cut it off below grade. So you may have to dig a small pit around that casing to three or four feet below grade and then cut it off and then fill back in with earth material. But the well should be completely filled with a certain amount of clay or cement that's not going to allow water through so that it can't be a source of contamination. Can you outline advice around installing manual pumps like the simpler bison models? Um, 
You know, um, we haven't got into that. You know, I realize there's a company now that even makes, it might be simple, uh, that makes a hand pump that fits on a well cap, but many states still don't allow those that way. And uh, a few states may, I don't know. But, um, you know, I don't know what, yeah. Uh, you know, it's just a piston pump and uh, it shouldn't affect your electric pump. Um, like the one I saw from Simple before. Um, it's just a got a, a pipe that drops down, you know, and it's got check valves in it going down to however, what level, level it needs. Or sometimes you may have to prime it, I guess. Um, but I don't really have any advice there. Um, yeah, I mean, you really have to have a good use for it. I guess if you're in an area where your power might go out or, um, yeah, that's, you know, I, the farm, I grew up on a farm. We went without power for seven days when I was 16 um, because of the ice storm. And it would have, uh, we, if we didn't have a generator that allowed us to run our fridge, heater, freezer, and uh, well, we would have been in some trouble for water for sure. Um, as it turned out, our generator was big enough to handle that. So um, I could see where a hand pump would be handy in a situation like that. But just remember, the more things you do with your well, the more uh, open it will be for, uh, yeah, you don't just want to have a bunch of holes in your cap, for instance. So, yeah, I don't have any better advice there. But if it's if it's got a pipe that runs all the way down, even past the pump, um, it shouldn't have any effect on the pump in the well. That I do realize. So um, understand. Had a well dynamited to improve flow. Was this okay? Yeah, actually, you know, people uh, call that fracking, right? Um, and that's fracking for oil that's brought up all the problems because of all the chemicals they use in order to increase the pressure. I mean, dynamiting is a way uh, to do the same thing. It's actually, so you have a bedrock well and there's not much water uh, because you have very few fractures. So uh, you can dynamite that down at depth and it should, in theory, uh, break open a lot of other fractures, which hopefully will increase flow to your well. Um, water fracking, per se, to improve water flow has been going on for 50 years. Um, and it is never an issue until all this stuff happened with uh, doing it for oil and um, using all these chemicals and all that stuff. And, and so um, I'm sure your state has rules on that. And hopefully, if you use a contracted driller, uh, to do that, they follow those rules and they're licensed. That's really the thing that wouldn't be okay in that situation. Um, I worked for a water treatment manufacturer and added a training session in late December 2020. Only four of the 45 well drillers were offering solutions to customers' water treatment issues after they drilled the well. Do you find this common throughout the U.S.? Our presentation focused on why diversity of your business and finish the job to make it water quality for your customer. You know, there are drillers typically, um, some don't want to mess with any of that. They will recommend another person um, or they start working with a treatment professional uh, who becomes part of their business. We have a lot of drillers who don't even install pumps. Um, one of the things that I recommend in our class, even uh, in the lesson that talks about drillers and how to make sure you're getting a good driller and all that stuff, is I would pick a driller that also installs pumps. Because uh, we've seen cases where a driller will say, well, that's the pump installer's issue, that contractor you used. Or um, the contractor will say, well, that's because of the well. You need to talk to the well driller. And so to avoid that ever happening, you need one company who does both. So your water system, you know who you're going to contact whenever you're installing that. Um, you know, the same, I guess, could be said for water treatment. But there's a conflict of interest there. Because, uh, you know, there's been a lot of issues historically, and I'm not claiming, again, there's bad apples in every industry, of people being sold equipment they don't need, using tests that are done in the field with, you know, litmus tests and things like that, where they convince people they need treatment, and they're not being professional or honest. And so, to me, separating that is an important issue, because now you're making the driller have incentive uh, to add those things when they're not always necessary. And you can disagree with me on that, but I can give you a dozen examples of that happening. And uh, you know, folks like Eric Yegi at the Water Quality Association, hopefully you are have went through their program where you've been certified by them. 
they actually have done a lot to try to clean those things up and increase the reputation of all treatments dollars by creating some of those credentials. And um, I agree if you have the right company and they have the right professional business sense, it would make sense. But on the other side, you have people who take advantage of that uh, combined effort and cause problems. In the end, uh, saying all of what I just said, in the end, it's on the well owner to make sure they understand those things so they don't get sold things they don't need, which is why they need to test. I run into people all the time who have treatment and I ask them, could you have a water test I could look at? Oh, we never had our water tested. We just added treatment. You know, um, that is not the way you should handle your water system. You don't know what it's doing, how it's changing things. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues related to water treatment, which, um, yeah, that's my take on it. I'd be glad to discuss that further with you. So, and I, there's also companies that do do all those, even they have their own lab uh, for testing. But again, there's a separation of powers there that um, in the wrong hands um, abuses it. And uh, there's no way to govern any of that. There's no rules, there's no laws. And so, um, you know, it puts the well owner at a disadvantage or could. And, uh, you know, my job is to focus on what's best for well owners, not the treatment companies or people making money off of well owners. Okay. Um, and if I find a good, I'll say also, if I find a good business or good industry, I rely on those people. I contact them regularly. There's several drillers I rely on for, for answers to questions. Uh, there are several treatment people I rely on, including the Water Quality Association. Um, and so, but that's a trial and error thing. And I'm in a position where I can meet a lot of good and bad uh, because of what I do. Um, well owners don't have that opportunity. It's a one-time thing and it's a lot of money. And so uh, hopefully, you know, there's folks out there who are looking after them, if you will. Um, if an abandoned well, uh, if an abandoned well that is artesian or otherwise perfect, except it's within a 100 feet setback of a newly installed septic field, is it worth keeping? Well, if your rules say 100 feet, um, then you need to get a variance if you want to keep the well, and you'd have to prove that it's within that. And 100 feet must be the setback in your state, which it looks like it's uh, New York, but I don't know what the rule is. Uh, let me see here. A new well has otherwise been drilled that is beyond the 100 foot setback and is safe. Advice here would help decide if it's better to properly fill and abandon the artesian or try and keep using the old one. You know, that's something that's, uh, for me personally, I'd need to be involved with the situation and actually look at all the issues. Um, yeah, because, um, you know, I recommend you do what's most protective, depending on the, where you're at in New York. Again, if you're in an area where there's a lot of fractures at the surface and there's other septic systems, you know, even at 100 feet, your well's not safe. I know um, around some of the lakes, you can't even install a regular septic system with a septic field because there's no way the properties are too small and the geology is such that it's going to contaminate your neighbor's well regardless. So they're required to have advanced septic treatment that you know includes removal of contaminants before it's released or some of those don't even release, they have to be pumped. Uh, and so there's just a lot of situations there that, um, yeah. Um, I, I mean, basically the two things you could do is one, you could try to seek a variance for your well that's less than a hundred feet and I don't know how that's handled in New York, probably locally at a county level. Um, the other, um, yeah, that's really your only option, or fill it in, yeah. Um, I don't see another option. And to clarify, a flowing well, well, let me say this the other way. To clarify, an artesian well may or may not flow. The definition of artesian isn't flowing, but if it's flowing, it's definitely artesian. So artesian means it's under pressure greater than atmospheric at the top of the aquifer. So if you have a well where the aquifer starts at 100 feet, you're in clay until you hit bedrock at 100 feet, you drill the well into that, say you drill to 300 feet, and then when the water level stabilizes and you've you know, cleaned it all out and everything's hunky-dory, 
if the water level in that well is above 100 feet below land surface, that means it's under pressure greater than atmospheric in the aquifer. So it's under pressure, say the water level is at 60 feet, it's still artesian, it just doesn't flow. Okay, just to, sorry, I got off on a side tangent there. But yeah, I think you have to deal with that locally um, because someone who um, is in charge of those setbacks would be the person to talk to, and they're gonna tell you if they even allow variances. Um, but I know sometimes when in, on smaller properties that are close together, they can apply for in some states. Again, I don't know if this is New York. You can apply for a variance to allow wells closer than 100 feet, for instance, just because you couldn't have a well uh, except on every other property if you didn't do it that way. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your thoughts on iron bacteria actually being biofilm and not iron? Well, iron bacteria is biofilm. It's not iron. They use iron to for food. Uh, so I'm not sure what your question is. I mean, iron bacteria are uh, bacteria that use iron for food. And just like sulfate reducing bacteria are bacteria that use sulfate. They reduce it, it creates uh, hydrogen sulfide, you know, that's what you smell. So it's not iron. I mean, iron is an element, right? Or it's a metal. And it's when it reaches, it gets in contact with oxygen, forms iron oxide, which causes the brown and black staining. Um, and it's totally different than iron bacteria. Um, and it's all, instead of treating the water, why not solve the problem at the source? Well, if you can, um, and if it's not too expensive. And I understand there are folks out there who work on those issues. Um, but they're not everywhere, and not every well owner can afford that, um, per se. And, uh, you know, it's complicated. And uh, I'm not saying they can't do that, and that's one option. Um, but it's not necessarily, uh, you know, I have just heard a story about how difficult it was to find that out, exactly what was going on. It turned out to be a totally different condition than what they thought, and it took two years to solve. So a lot of well owners wouldn't have the patience or uh, the money for something like that. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, for those that stuck around, I really appreciate it. Uh, we still have 90 folks. I think we had a little over 200 to start with. I don't blame you for leaving. It's supposed to be an hour and a half. Uh, sorry I'm a talker, but I really appreciate uh, everyone who did stick around. And again, if you have any questions at all, there's our email address, info at privatewellclass.org. When you get a, in an hour or so, you're gonna get a thing that says, thanks for attending. That actually uh, has my email address on it. And uh, I usually get a few emails from that every time. Feel free to do that if you'd like. Um, we do get a lot of emails. So sometimes I can't get to things right away. And so be patient. And if you're interested in CEUs or a certificate, use the same email address. Katie monitors that email address. And um, again, uh, it takes us a little time to work through those. There were 200 people on today. Um, even if a third of those ask for certificates, there's a little work involved on, on our end to do that. Um, one, we do verify that you're actually on and participating the entire time or close to it. And, uh, and so um, we need to do our due diligence there. Uh, we take our responsibility as a provider pretty seriously. So thanks again. and. Uh, you can go on our webpage under webinars and events to see what our webinar will be next month. Uh, sometimes again, they're for professionals, not for regular well owners per se. We still have well owners attend those sometimes and that's fine, um, we, but I typically don't answer regular well owner questions and try to answer ones that are more on topic uh, for those. All right, thanks again. Thanks, Katie. Um, everyone have a safe uh, weekend and on forward. All right.